Scarborough School Board business meeting for today, April 4th. Can I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Mrs. Glidden? Here. Mr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. Can you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? Um, just one. I would request that we move agenda item 8.5 up to be right below public comment as we have one of our teachers here, Brianna Kalman, to speak about the high school 2020 Spain trip proposal. Okay, great. So done. Okay, 5.0 public comments on agenda items. Mm -hmm. If there's anybody who would like to have anything to say tonight, please come to the podium. You have three minutes. If you could state your name and your address, please. Hello, my name is Meredith Tassie-Barrell and our family lives at 15 Chestnut Drive in Scarborough. I would like to take this opportunity to talk to you about Unified Sports in Scarborough and the recent decision to move the expansion of the Scarborough Middle School Unified Team to the high school level at an absurdly inflated cost of $17,800 to be an unmet need for 2019-2020. Special Olympics has been part of my life since I was in elementary school. I'm the coordinator of Special Olympics and Unified Sports and MSCD6 Bonnie Eagle. In the last two weeks, I have become an advocate as we face cuts at the national level and now shockingly in the town I believed was the best fit for our family. We have three daughters, Camden, a sixth grader, Zoe, a fourth grader, and an infant named Harper. Our girls have watched me volunteer, coach, and have started volunteering themselves. Camden, our sixth grader, made us incredibly proud this year as she represented Scarborough Middle School at the Choose to Include Summit and helped advocate for a unified basketball team at Scarborough Middle School. Their first year has been wildly successful and engaging for the community. For those of you that don't know what unified sports are, it's a program of the Special Olympics that joins people with and without intellectual disabilities on the same team. It was inspired by a simple principle. Training together and playing together is a quick path to friendship and understanding. In unified sports, teams are made up of people of similar age and ability. Here in the state of Maine, the Maine Principals Association approved and sanctioned high school basketball for its first season in January of 2015. Special Olympics offered $3,000 grants to each high school in Maine and Scarborough made the decision to not participate. A similar decision was made by the athletic director again in 2016, 2017, 2018, and again in 2019. And now for the 2020 season, he's declared it an unmet need at our local budget. Families have asked, staff members have offered to help, to plan, to coach. Special Olympic officials have had personal conversations requested meetings and offered assistance to Scarborough each year since 2015. Financial grants have been offered each year, yet there has been no change in Scarborough's participation. Over 60 other schools in Maine have created, embraced, celebrated, and encouraged unified basketball at their school. Scarborough has not. Unified basketball came a reality at the middle school this year. It took a sixth grader who had seen and volunteered in unified sports who just wanted to play basketball against her friends on a unified team in another town. A courageous new administrator had experienced the benefits of unified sports in her previous district. Guidance from leaders of the Special Olympics of Maine, school <laughs> staff who supported their student body thinking outside of the box, and most importantly, 34 amazing kids who wanted to participate to create a unified team at Scarborough Middle School that is changing our community and the school for the better. I ask you to please educate yourself on the actual resources needed to fund a unified basketball team and then add those funds back into the budget so that Scarborough High School can be the 55th sanctioned co-ed high school unified basketball team who will proudly wear the Scarborough uniforms in the 2020 season. I appreciate your time and I'm open to any questions I can answer. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Cindy Parento. I live at 21 Hunter Point Drive. My daughter Brianna, an eighth grader at Scarborough Middle School who just happens to have Down syndrome, came home yesterday full of excitement as she had just signed up for her freshman year classes. 
Then she told me she also wanted to sign up for Unified Basketball, and I sighed because I had just found out that day that the funding for Unified Basketball had already been cut in next year's budget. How would I tell her? Brianna's favorite thing in the world, her passion, is sports. What this teenager chooses to do with all her free time is to watch reruns of professional sports games. When she gets the chance to participate, she jumps on it. When Brianna went to the orient orientation night at the high school this year, the message she was given from students and staff was, follow your passion, join activities, make new friends. Well, you see, my daughter wants to join a sports team, but as a student with an intellectual disability, there is no safe athletic activity at the high school for her to actively participate in, not one. This year, as an eighth grader, Brianna was able to participate in the Choose to Include Summit, the Unity Club, Unified flag football with the Gorham High School team and unified basketball games. Unified basketball at the middle school was life changing, not just for her, but for the whole school community. The unifying effect it had on not only the 35 students involved, but the staff and the fans, well, there are no words to describe it. Our community needs more of this. Brianna is now so much more confident with her peers and her teachers report that she has grown leaps and bounds in her academics and her social skills and her behavior in school. Brianna feels like she has real friends for the first time, that she is seen, she is heard, and she feels like she belongs. On the day she was born and I was handed this most unexpected diagnosis, this is all I could have ever wanted for her. This is all any parent would want for their child. This just proves that the social inclusion and understanding that happens during unified sports does not incur occur in a classroom. Special Olympics athletes are the same as athletes everywhere. They play sports for the same reasons and benefit in the same ways. I'm here to ask you to consider the reasons why Scarborough schools continue to have a severe deficit in equal athletic opportunities for our disabled high school students. Is the lack of funding and creative solutions really still ethically and legally justifiable on this, the fifth year, after the MPA has partnered with the Special Olympics to sanction unified sports? <coughs> Friends of mine and staff members have admitted on numerous occasions that they are even embarrassed to tell others that Scarborough does not have a high school unified team, when they should be able to talk about their town and school with pride. Since 2015, around 60 other districts in Maine have made financial commitments to unified sports, but Scarborough's leadership team decided that the only athletic opportunity that my daughter can access in high school was not worthy of funding. Why not, Scarborough? You are sitting behind that table today, not because it is comfortable or easy, but because you are change makers. You question the status quo. You want to unify our district and move it forward. I'm asking you to be that change and to invest in all students and commit equal activities funding for unified sports at the high school next year. I can't wait for the day that I can share with my daughter the good news. Thank you. Any other comments? Hi, Erin Rowan, 14 Bonnie Grove Drive. Um, my comments are also related to the school budget. Uh, my daughter Kerrigan is a fifth grader who was born with Down syndrome. Parents joke about wishing their babies came with instructions. Mine came with five manuals, 10 specialists, and a slew of information teaching me everything from how to help her eat without aspirating to how to talk to her about sex. I wish I was kidding about that last thing, but since women with intellectual disabilities are 12 times more likely to be sexually assaulted, we take it pretty seriously. Well, that statistic is alarming. It's not surprising when you consider how completely most people with intellectual disabilities, or IDD, are segregated from their peers. From the time they're toddlers, most spend the majority of their days in separate settings with adults who have power over them and where there are no competent witnesses. In Scarborough, Kerrigan is one of very few students with intellectual disabilities to be fully included in regular education. In fact, a club at the high school called the Buddy System was started after a student realized none of her friends knew who she was talking about when she mentioned her volunteer experiences in the life skills classroom. It was like the disabled students didn't even exist. 65 years after Brown versus the Board of Education said separate is not equal, 45 years after Section 504, 
prohibited disability discrimination in education, 43 years after IDEA opened the doors of neighborhood public schools, and nearly 29 years after the ADA promised disabled people civil rights, Kerrigan only gets to enjoy these rights if gatekeepers like judges, policymakers, school administrators, and teachers decide to grant her that privilege. In addition to the alarming sexual assault statistics, and in spite of laws designed to protect and support them, people with disabilities are twice as likely to be victims of violent crime. Only 36% are employed, and 21% live in poverty. So what does all this have to do with the budget proposal? Scarborough Public School's mission statement says that its fundamental purpose is to provide a safe and inclusive learning environment where each and every student is empowered to be a resilient lifelong learner who is prepared to engage as a contributing member of society. And yet our leadership team decided that hiring inclusion and UDL specialists should remain unmet needs. Our long range vision says we will be a school district that provides enriching co-curricular experiences and a vibrant learning community while preparing them for highly engaged, fulfilling lives. Yet in spite of having 27 varsity teams and 12 JV teams in 17 high school sports, the leadership team decided not to fund one unified sports basketball team at the high school. Other than the buddy system, which is a club where non-disabled students volunteer to accompany disabled students to school events that don't have the infrastructure to support their participation, there's nothing for students like Kerrigan. But you know what has the power to mitigate those awful statistics I shared earlier? To make sure my daughter gets a shot at her highly engaged and fulfilling life? More than 30 years of research says the answer is equity-based inclusive education. I've been told to be patient, to wait for the culture shift. Not all teachers believe in inclusion. But as Kerrigan prepares for middle school, as half the voters in town continue to believe the stream of disinformation that holds our school budget hostage each year, and as we have to start from scratch with each new teacher we meet, I've come to realize that someday is too far away to get here before my daughter's high school graduation. The truth is, we won't ever arrive at some day unless we invest in the infrastructure of inclusion. That means supporting teachers with staff development, common planning time, inclusion in UDL consultants, accessible curricula, and offering co-curricular activities that ensure my daughter has something to write about in her college essay, rather than her simply being a subject of inspiration in someone else's. Thank you. I wish I had a prepared statement. Um, those are really well um, written out. Uh, my wife has already sent an email um, to the board and to Julie. And I do want to call out and say, Julie, I really appreciate your response on the same day. Um, I grew up as a son of a school administrator, a superintendent. <coughs> and back then, there was no email. There was no Facebook. Um, he had to deal with the public like twice, you know, once every two weeks, or when he was at a sporting event, or you know, whatever. So, um, I can't imagine what it's like nowadays in that position. And I appreciate, uh, like I said, getting back to us the same day. Um, so yeah, her email was much more well thought out than um, mine. I just want to, um, well, first of all, introduce myself. Sorry, uh, Steve Sponseller at 53 Gunstock Road. Um, two boys in the school system. Um, our oldest boy is a sixth grader and participates in uh, this first year of Unified Club. Um, I, uh, I can't describe like how awesome the uh, experience is for him um, as a, I think, a, a partner. Um, you know, in today's society where um, it's all about division and um, you know just the name Unified Club, I think, speaks to. Um, you know, the, the, uh, how much our <coughs> community could benefit from a program like this. Um, sport, youth sports today, I have my own opinions about that. Um, it's all about winning. And what's so great about Unified Club is that it's not about winning. It's about teamwork and inclusion. And um, I'd like to see it continue. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, the high school 2020 Spain trip proposal.
Thank you for having me. I'm Brianna Kalman. I teach Spanish at Scarborough High School. Um, I'm here to propose a 2020 Spain trip in June when school ends. Um, it is the trip that I do every other year. Um, we will be going to, or would be going to Barcelona, Valencia, Granada, Sevilla, the Costa del Sol, and Madrid on this trip. Um, as I said, it's 11 days. Some of the things that we would be doing, we'd be going to the Prado Museum, exploring artistic masterpieces, uh, visiting the Royal Palace in Madrid, uh, the Sagrada Familia, Las Ramblas in Barcelona, and of course the Alhambra in Granada. Um, the tour company that I work with is EF Tours. This will be the fifth time that I've worked with them, so I've had a really good experience with them each time. Um, let's see, I, it's for students who have been taking Spanish for three years by the end of next year, so students who have three years completed at that time. Um, the goal is to have about 12 to 18 students Two chaperones minimum, it would be Miss Van Ness, the French teacher, and myself. Um, we usually travel together, so that is the plan. The price is uh, $3,865, but it includes round trip airfare, on tour transportation, hotels, uh, breakfast and dinner daily, a tour director who meets us at the airport when we land and doesn't leave us until we fly off home. So um, we have a person with us the entire time that is a local. Uh, we, it covers daily activities, entrances to attractions, museums, and insurance, which I think is really important. So uh, we're really excited to get this going for next year. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer it. Can you just repeat the price per student again? Yep, it is $3,865. It goes up a little bit every year, unfortunately, but you do get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, how do you... You said you take 8 to 12 students? Sorry, 12 to 18 is my goal. Oh, okay. And how do you choose those students? Um, uh, I present it to all students who have taken or will have taken three years of Spanish at the end of next year. And uh, Sorry, I, meant, I guess if you, if you have more than that. I am comfortable with smaller groups, so if there were a larger group, I would limit it to 18. So. Some teachers, I think, are comfortable with large groups, but does that answer your question? I just meant like first come first serve or do you? Yes. Okay. The window for signing up is about a week and the reason for that is to give people enough time over a year to pay for that kind of expense. Okay. Are there any grade requirements? Grade requirements? Mm -hmm. It used to be 85 or above for like as an average but now I'm going to change it to 80. Some of the most enthusiastic students aren't always the highest. Is the full cost on the on the families? The funding? yes, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I, just, you said they have. Do they have more than? Do they have to pay the entire cost at once? No, there are payment plans available. Okay. There's different options, whichever works best for a family. I think it has to be paid uh, a month or two ahead of time, but they can spread it out throughout that time. Sounds like a fun trip. It will be fun. <laughs> I'm excited. All right. Thank Great. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. Thank you. Okay. 6.0, student representatives report. Well, while we uh, get started, we actually invited a group today, uh, the Oak Hill Players. Uh, we invited Deb Doherty, the director, and Katie Fitzgibbons, who is one of the actresses. Um, so if you'd like to come on up and Hi, I'm Deb Doherty and it's my first year with Oak Hill Players. Uh, it's been, it's been a wonderful transition for me and hopefully for the students as well. You oh, can, for sure. You can go. <laughs> Yeah, hi, I'm Katie Fitzgibbons. I'm a junior at Scarborough High School, and I'd have to say, this year with Deb Doherty has really been a breath of fresh air with OHP. Thank you so much for doing that everything, everything you do for our community. We all are so glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here. Me too. I've never gone to a school board meeting. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> all for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to say thank you to Ms. Ketch for approving the master class. Thank you so much. That experience was so breathtaking. 
our school strives in excellence, and I really believe that that entire master class truly gave every student who was there a breath of hope and faith that, you know, anybody who can sing, who can dance, can really do something that they're passionate about, and I'm really glad that that was an opportunity. Thank you so much. The master class, just to clarify, um, <laughs> we, we brought up some um, New York professionals that are in the industry to work with the kids for a weekend. And they got together on Friday night, they presented their material, and then on Saturday they had individual coaching by the, the um, Broadway people that came in and coached them not only on just how to sing a song, but how to connect with the material. And I watched these kids. I just sat on the side and let them do their thing. And in some very unconventional ways, <laughs> they got out of, out of these kids things that the kids weren't even aware that they had inside of them. And it was, that is my whole theory on the arts, is that the arts presents itself in way more beneficial than just singing and dancing, but in understanding and in confidence and in communication with the world, not just while you're on stage, but as you can see, Katie being eloquent while she stands here, in, in many different ways that carries on to whether they are performers or whether they go into a different industry, they learn to be comfortable in the audition room, which means they're going to be comfortable in an interview. And the arts just makes you think deeper and be able to present uh, yourself in a way that sometimes you can't unless you understand what has to come out from the inside. And um, we've had a wonderful year teaching and letting the kids explore that. And I want to be able to do more. Uh, that was my beginning of a series that I'm hoping we'll be able to continue yearly. Um, and uh, we also need to expose them to good theater. Um, we're going to Les Mis down in Boston in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and we are, uh, and we're, we're going to you know, do the national tour, do the professional theater. My hope. I've seen Les Mis 14 times. I, you know, I just, you know, my hope in taking the students is to let them experience really good theater and get charged about it so that they'll want to go to the ART the next time and get to see a work that hasn't gone to Broadway <coughs> but is in development so that they can share in the developmental process of that. I had the benefit of doing that for both Waitress, Finding Neverland, Night of the Iguana with James Earl Jones in a very small setting where these students come in and they can question and answer afterwards. They watch these performances and they watch the development that happens in Cambridge in a small theater to the end result on Broadway. And it's a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, the ART is, is affiliated with Harvard and it's just a, a, a magical way to to view it all and take it all in. And then this year, we're going to do Peter Pan. So with full flying. We did very well financially last year in our, um, in our production of All Shook Up. The show cost us about $10,000 to put up uh, for production costs, and we made about 20. So, so we, we did very well with ticket sales, and I intend for Peter Pan to double. <laughs> so, so we're uh, you know we're excited. We're doing full flying. The insurance companies are involved. <laughs> We've got a professional company coming in to do it all. We've checked out right, left, up, down, and everything. So we will be fine, and it will be safe. So, um, so I'm excited about that, and I'm excited about working with these kids. They're wonderful students. And it's, it's just really, really <laughs> exciting to be here. So thank you very much for bringing me on. And I hope to show you some great things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming. Any questions?
I don't really have a question, but I have a comment. I just wanted to say um, that I appreciate Dylan and Kristen bringing um, different groups and activities to us at the board meetings because it really feels good to have some direct connection with what's going on. Um, and I do recognize you both from All Shook Up. I saw you at the end of the performance and you during the performance. Um, and you, it's, it was really fun. And I'm excited for your program. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Mine's more of a confession than a question. So I was actually an orphan in Oak Hill Players' Oliver Twist many, many years ago when Principal Ketch was the director of it. And I still sing the songs, and I still remember it to this day. So what you're doing is such valuable work. It sticks it with these kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not singing it now. No, no, no. No, no. Maybe next time if there's time. You know. Busy agenda. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Dylan, for sure. Yes, thanks, Dylan. Thank you. So to continue on with our report, um, recently the PTA held their annual STEAM fair, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And as you can see in these photos, students were able to learn about different areas of STEAM and further their interests. Um, as you can also see, pizza was provided, which is always the best way to get students excited about learning science. <laughs> Um, I mean, it sounds like we've heard plenty about Unified Basketball tonight, but I would like to kind of add some more in. Um, just last Tuesday, they had their last home game with Bonnie Eagle. Uh, I unfortunately was unable to attend. I feel like we had some sort of board thing, but I know <laughs> we were talking about it and we were all kind of a little upset we weren't able to attend, but it does always sound like it's a huge hit. Uh, from what I've heard, the crowd, the stands are always full. Um, and I'm excited to see what happens next. Um, over the past week, kindergarten students at Blue Point learned about the life cycle of animals and they completed this fun project to go along with it. Um, as you can see, they were asked to create um, a frog based on the life cycle stages of frogs. So I actually went into Miss Lee's classroom and witnessed these students creating these projects and it was adorable. They got so excited about coloring in all the stages and the frog spaces. Wow, it's like we're switching back and forth. Here. Um, <laughs> I think it's mostly my fault for like adding stuff in and then forgetting which order we're in. <laughs> so <laughs> I just wanted to share some photos last weekend, weekend before maybe. Um, I can't remember, but the Jim Dandies had their annual uh, community performance. As always, they did a phenomenal job. Uh, I remember doing gym babies forever ago, but it, it's insane what they can teach students these days. I remember it used to, oh yeah, okay, no, okay, so I remember when I was in like fifth grade, it was amazing when people could juggle five, and they can do more now. I don't, I don't have the type of concentration. You can do anything with hard work and effort, Dylan. Right. Yes. <laughs> Um, the Interact Club at the high school just began their food drive for the Ronald McDonald House in Portland. The club is accepting any non-perishable food items and goods, and the donation box is located right outside the library, and any donation is greatly appreciated. Also, the Model United Nations Club at the high school is hosting an antique show and bake sale this Saturday. Um, it's a major fundraiser for their upcoming conference in May, and they would love to see anyone come out to support the club. All right, I'm gonna make these ones kind of quick because we do have an exciting budget presentation coming up. <laughs> Excited about that. All right, so on March 16th, the jazz band performed in the Maine State Jazz Festival at South Portland High School. Uh, I believe they got their scores, but they're still calculating the order of which people came in because it, there's a lot of like critiquing that goes on. Um, but I'll keep you updated if I find out more. On let me see. On March 19th, we had our annual guest conductor series concert featuring Mark Zielinski, maybe I pronounced that right, um, from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, the concert featured all three of our bands, concert and symphonic band and our wind, wind ensemble. Uh, I, if you ever get a chance to go to any of the band concerts, they're phenomenal. I love going to listen to those. They're just absolutely incredible. It sounds like an orchestra you'd go to see in some professional like orchestra. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, to continue with band, just this week, today and yesterday actually, uh, the main band district festival came and there are, I believe, 70 schools through across Maine, New England, uh, can't come, oh, Maine, obviously, and they came, participated, and it's, I heard music from 11 to, it's probably still playing right now, uh, last couple days, and it's just really exciting to see all these different students and schools come to perform these and compete. It's just great music to hear in the hallway. Um, and then this, actually, I just found out about today, but uh, Representative Pingree contacted the Science Bowl team after finding out they had won second place, and she wrote a little letter to them uh, to tell, congratulate them for all their great work, and it, they, like, I had to take pictures because they wouldn't give me the letter to bring in. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was already in the brain. But it came in this really professional, like, congressional like folder and they were just so proud of it they, That's oh my goodness <laughs> and then the variety show I hope any and all of you got to go and see this this was just last Thursday there were acts from dancing to singing to we had a band perform we even had someone on a unicycle it was quite impressive um, there I was sent like 40 or 50 photos I just had to choose the ones that would fit but the, every single one of these performances that they do are just absolutely incredible. So I highly recommend, if you get a chance, go and see it. And I believe this was the first of an annual mm -hmm. event, so you can go next year. All right. Thank you. That's all. Sorry. <clears throat> point out, superintendent's report. So to kick off my report, I'd like to invite Joanna Martell um, up to the podium to talk with you all about a grant that she recently helped us achieve to support our Career Pathways Fund. Joanna, if you could just give a little background about your connections to Scarborough and um, what you're currently doing and then let us sure. know about the grant. Thank sure. you. Uh, my name is Joanna Martell and um, I'm very excited to have been asked to address you this evening. Um, Tonight what I'd like to do is talk about how the Scarborough Education Foundation was the recipient of funds from the Bangor Savings Bank Foundation to benefit the Scarborough schools and enhance student experiences. I'm an education consultant and the owner of Martell Learning Group out of Saco. The mission of the Martell Learning Group is to improve the lives and opportunities of learners through vision, planning, and execution of private, public, and entrepreneurial educational programming. Personally, I've been in education for 25 or more years as a teacher, as an administrator, and as a curriculum coordinator. And just last year, I interned at the Scarborough High School and at the Central Office on projects which aimed to bring local companies and citizens into contact with high school students while strengthening the infrastructure of the current curricula. When I learned that high school student, high school teacher, Christy Zavaznik, Superintendent Kuchenberger, and others were exploring avenues to, to supplement funding for the Career Pathways Program. Martell Learning Group volunteered to explore local funding sources that had similar missions and visions for strengthening the community. Dr. Kuchenberger and Interim Principal Sue Ketch championed the initiative with SEF, SEDCO, the Chamber of Commerce, and understand the value and necessity of regulation and proper funding channels. The use of a 501c3 nonprofit fiscal sponsor was agreed upon. Ms. Kate Bolton, it should be noted, worked very hard to develop the memorialized understanding or the MOU, which is now, I believe, in its substantial final form. It's an outlining of the relationship between SEF with the Scarborough schools without having to be a formal contract. The former president and fundraising chair of SEF, Mr. Brian Shumway, and I then began to work on writing our first grant together. For the Bangor Savings Bank Foundation seemed apropos. We were greatly assisted in this work by Ms. Carol Colson, who's the senior vice president, director of community relations and communications for Bangor Savings Bank, who clarified and directed us in many helpful ways. 
Bangor Savings Bank Vice President and Scarborough Branch Manager, as well as former Scarborough School parent, Ms. Helen Sella, also gave us insight and rallied the troops in our favor. Uh, that and personally talked to me a lot about how the Career Pathways Initiative would have been great for her kids had they still been in school. Also, Bangor Savings Bank employees championed the project with their administration and local community members also spread the word. Though we had less than four weeks and it was over the Christmas holidays from the time we started to work on our application to its due date, Editors and board members all rallied to meet the deadline, even from the ski slopes. And our deadline was met as of January 1st. In mid-March, SEF received the good news that Bangor Savings Bank Foundation had awarded us $5,000 in grant funding. It's a testament to the joint efforts of the central office, the high school administration, and educators closely associated with the project that so many local businesses and community organizations such as SEDCO, School and Business Partnership, Chamber of Commerce, and SEF were all supportive and understanding of the need for programming like the Career Pathways Initiative. By funding the core program and its school budget and using philanthropy to fund the piloting of enhancements and expansions of programs, the Scarborough Board of Education has created a sustainable model of education enhancement and demonstrated the value of community-based partnerships to students to faculty, and to the constituency. Those students fortunate enough to participate in programs supported by Career Pathways Fund have the opportunity to hold a deeper commitment and understanding of their future goals and careers while still in high school. This can save their families money, time, and energy while building positive experiences for employers and future employees that will hopefully enjoy the idea of returning to our state and local community. Martell Learning Group and SEF will be exploring more grant funding in the near future uh, to add to this and other initiatives. Though none are guaranteed, we're greatly encouraged, not only by the positive response from the Bangor Savings Bank Foundation, uh, from which we are very grateful, but also we are encouraged by the great energy, the structured forward movement, the open-mindedness of all involved in many entrepreneurial educational initiatives happening in the Scarborough schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me to speak here tonight. And thank you for supporting the Career Pathways Initiative. If you have any questions, I have no problem answering the best I can. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? I, I just want to thank you for all the work you've done to coordinate this effort. And thanks to SEF and everybody involved in central office. This is a game changer, I think, in a lot of ways to move this initiative forward and to can start to fund it the way it needs to be fund, funded. So thank you. You're very welcome. I, I would just add a couple of things. Um, one, we do currently have a targeted fundraising effort going on. If you go to our website, you'll see the button, the Career Pathways um, logo. It looks like a sun coming over the horizon, and we're, we do have that partnership that Joanna mentioned with um, Scarborough Ed Foundation, Seth, and SEDCO. Uh, our goal is to try to raise as much funds as we can in order to supplement the work that needs to be happening in our schools and outside of our schools as our students, uh, as we expand opportunities for career exploration. And next month we hope, or not next month, but next meeting, we plan to have, um, hopefully Christy Zavaznik will be able to come and give you sort of an overview, and then we have a sneak peek at a very specific internship project that's already yielding um, positive benefits for our school system. I also want to just thank Joanna publicly. She's been a great asset to our organization as an intern, um, but then also taking on this project. And after she was already well invested and working towards um, helping us secure this grant, I said, so how are we paying you? She's like, well, we haven't really figured that out yet. <laughs> um, and so I don't know many people that would give so much time and energy and really you were holding us accountable to meet the deadlines um, with that kind of uncertainty. So I greatly appreciate your commitment to our to our kids and our. It's schools. been a pleasure. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seven point two. Oh, yeah. Let's see over here for this. Um, so it's the first meeting of the month. So we're taking a look at our enrollment once again. 
Um, and you'll see here now that we've added this additional column, which includes the latest data from our uh, newest enrollment study that was just completed in 2018 and presented to us in 2019. Um, this month, we have our, our enrollment is decreased by four students overall, and you can see the net change at each of the phase levels. I won't read the numbers to you. Um, but the thing I'd like to draw your attention to is if you look over here in the light blue column, this is sort of what the data was saying about our enrollment projections. We were never really relying on this number over the past um, three or four years because we knew that it wasn't accurate. Um, this one took into consideration all of the development that was happening in town at the time the study was completed and was proving to be pretty accurate right up until this school year when we noticed that there were some variances, which is why we uh, re-employed Rebecca Wandell to help us update our enrollment um, projections. And this is her latest study. As I said, it was just presented to the board on January 14th, I think. Um, if you're interested in re-watching that presentation, it's very informative. And you can see here that although much more accurate, um, you know, there's still a little bit of variance. So we watch this every single month. We use this to drive our decision making. This is actually the first step in the budget process is to look at our enrollment projections um, and assess our personnel needs. Um, so this is data that we get really excited about watching and um, using, but it also is, is critical for the community to understand that although over the years our enrollment numbers have declined as a whole, what we really need to pay attention to is what's happening at each of the individual phase levels, um, and those projections really help us think about the future, particularly when it comes time for budget. Any questions about that? Okay, so now I'll shuttle on over. Mr. Legum. So um, good evening. Tonight, Kate and I, Kate Bolton, our business manager slash, slash HR specialist um, slash all other things that need to get done in a timely way, um, manager is going to assist me in presenting tonight. We'll kind of jump in and out as we uh, we talk about this all day, every day. So I think that um, having two voices will just make it much more enjoyable for your listening pleasure. The first thing I would want to say, and Kate, feel free to add to this, is that we've had a fun and busy week talking about the budget. Um, this board has been engaged in a variety of conversations. Um, they had the amazing opportunity and fortune to spend three hours with our entire leadership council, or at least most of our leadership council, on Tuesday morning, where they heard from the departments that we call our essential operations. So they heard about facilities. Um, we included athletics and activities in that conversation. They heard about transportation and food service and our health service provider um, providers' needs. And then on Wednesday night, or afternoon, we spent another two and a half hours together hearing directly from our director of special services and our principals. And you know, Kate and I jumped in throughout those six hours as well. Last night, um, Tom Hall and I together presented the FY20 budget overview, which is meant to be a really high level, sort of what's the bottom line um, conversation, knowing that this process, this entrance into the first reading is really um, the conversation starter. And so we hear the advocacy for things to be added to the budget. Um, people have asked questions about things that are included in the budget. Is that really necessary? What I would want the community to know is that we're just getting started. Um, we've done a lot of work to this point and made a lot of really hard decisions, um, none of which we're you know, over the moon about. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that here today. And I just want to have full appreciation for the amount of work that goes into getting to this point. Um, we really started back in late November. I mean, that never really ends, but officially started with that enrollment analysis and personnel anal analysis in late November, early December. Um, and then tonight, we're gonna take that overview that you heard last night and unpack it a little bit more so you can understand sort of our thought process and where we are. And then it really is passing it over to the board upon their approval and upon, upon the town council's approval next Wednesday of the first reading <laughs> to start having deep conversations about you know, what's in this budget and what's not in this budget. And you should know that everything is on the table. It's a 
It's an opportunity for us to hear from the community and to adjust our decisions based on what we all as a community think are the priorities. So just getting started um, with the process, really, for, for you folks. Would you add to that? Uh, no, I think that's great. I think that we talk a lot about the fact that we've been in the budget process. Maybe I should take this one. Huh? Is this one? Yeah. Um, we talk a lot about how we've been in the budget process for months and months and months. And so uh, at a certain point, I worry a little bit that, that I'm, I'm, I'm cutting corners when I'm, when I'm talking about things because it's sort of like, oh, well, you already know that. But then we continue to have new stakeholders and new visitors and new folks listening to the stories. So um, if we repeat ourselves, then you can start saying, all right, all right, enough. But if, if we are telling you new things, we hope that they're inspiring and, and that they're exciting to you as they are to us. So we'll start out with the first reading objectives. Um, really, tonight, it, our, our objectives are to share the FY20 Leadership Council budget proposal um, and talk to you a bit about how we got to this point, to clearly articulate the investment proposals in the FY20 budget process, um, and also to start that conversation, as I talked about just a few moments ago, and then prepare to refine our FY20 budget um, to maximize the available resources and respond to the uh, evolving student needs. And there are several items that we'll talk about tonight that are still in motion. So the silly part about this process is that we have to create this product which feels very final before we even have all the information. So it really is a living, breathing document um, as we work through this process. So my favorite way to start any conversation, the Leadership Council loves this metaphor. Um, I think about our, the foundation of our work, sarcasm, um, the foundation of our work is being a table. And if you think about you know, dining at a table with a wobbly leg, I don't know any person who enjoys that, right? And so when we think about how do we create a rock solid foundation that all of our work can rest upon, the table is my favorite metaphor. And I think of each leg, one as being the mission. This is why do we exist as an organization? And I'm so happy to hear parents paying attention to that mission and um, holding us accountable to it because that is exactly what its purpose is. Our vision, what type of school district are we trying to become? And then there's our values. So if this is what, why we exist and this is what we say we're trying to become, what are those collective commitments? How are we going to behave in order to make sure that we realize that mission and vision? And then, of course, our goals. What are those specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goals that we set each year in order to ensure that we're making one more step toward that vision and that we're living true by our values and to our mission? And so I won't read this all to you, um, as I, I but, well, maybe I will. Um, so this is our mission. This is why we exist. You know, what is our purpose? Without our children, we have no purpose. So the fundamental purpose of our work here in Scarborough Public Schools is to provide that safe, inclusive learning environment where each and every student is empowered to be a resilient, lifelong learner who's prepared to engage and be a, con and be a contributing member of society. And in order for us to do that, resources are so critically essential, right? Um, and I like to start this way, particularly when we're talking about the budget, because a lot of folks will want to notice that bottom line, and they'll want to think about that tax rate increase, and they'll want to think about how much we're spending more this year compared to last year. Um, but I like to remind us that we're literally talking about the lives of our children. We're talking about their future. And so this is our vision. This is what, this is actually a longer document, but I've just pulled out a couple pieces of it for you here. We are striving towards being a high quality, forward thinking public school district that's known for its whole child approach. Um, so we're not just thinking about the academic side, we're thinking about extracurriculars um, and all that goes with that social emotional learning and the behavioral interventions that we, um, we put in place for our students so that we have a vibrant learning community that's challenging our students, exciting their imagination, and instilling excellence in the, both their thoughts and their actions while we're preparing them for that highly engaging, fulfilling life. And you know, I believe that in order for us to realize this mission, we as a community, because the schools can't do it alone, have to be willing to do whatever it takes. We then organize some strategic actions around these three global themes, or four global themes. The first one is effective teaching and learning, of course, right, makes sense. Safe and inclusive schools, global citizenship, and community engagement. 
And tonight I thought, rather than just talking to you about what we're trying to become, I would share with you some evidence of what's actually happening in our schools. And you can see for yourself just one more step that we're taking towards making that vision real and really bringing it to life. Um, so this highlights some third and fourth graders from Katherine Hewitt's classroom. Um, Kelly, do you want to add anything to this intro before I? Um, I'll, I'll come speak after. Afterwards? Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Without further ado. When we were the tree hoppers, we were frustrated because things were going in the wrong bits. Eight little apples in the trash, which should have been shared on the share cart. Compost in the trash, what ends up in the landfill instead of the garden to grow healthy plants. Silver in the trash that wastes money. That wastes money. Water bottles are going in the trash, and we are wasting five cents a bottle that should be going in the return. We were also getting splashed by the food when people were dumping their trees. It was gross! We decided to do something about it, so we split into four groups. What goes where I made posters, silverware gathered information and made a video, share cart made more of announcements, and milk cards investigate why I can't compost the cards. Silverware! We are the first school in the district to change from plasticware to silverware. Soon all the schools may follow our example. We used to throw away over a thousand pieces of plastic wear each week. That cost us $25 each week. So instead of spending over $1,000 per year on plastic wear, we bought silverware for $300. Most important is keeping all that plastic out of the environment. Share card. If you have a whole apple, no teeth marks, it can go in the share card. An open milk card and some water can go in the share card too. What goes where? This is what can go in the compost. Snacks, sweets, milk, water, fruits, and veggies. This is what can go in trash. All wrappers, tinfoil, plastic, salad boxes, and milk credits. Wait! That's not right! Milk cartons now be recycled! <laughs> We contacted a lot of people to figure out how we could make things better. First, we contacted our custodian, Denise Westcott, to hear what she had to say. She explained how Garbage Garden couldn't take our compost because it was contaminated with milk cartons, trash, and so forth. She showed us how there is a layer of plastic on the carton that makes it toxic to compost. Next, we talked with Peter Esposito, our nutrition director. Dylan Hinton from the Eagle Club at the high school. They explained why we switch from silverware and plastic for to save money. But more important, we keep all that plastic out from the landfill. Next, we emailed Jean Driscoll at Oakhurst to see if they could um, <laughs> change the packaging. She told us to check with Public Works to see if we could recycle the cottons. Alicia Mayer wrote back and said to Katrina Van Heusen from EcoMate, our trash collector, who said we can recycle them, but don't forget to dump the milk out. Finally, we contacted Todd Jepson, director of building and maintenance, to see if he would approve this action. He did. So we are going to try this, and if it works, the rest of the school district may follow, follow our example. Let's, Let's see if we can make a difference. <laughs> Kelly Crosby, would you like to add a few words? <laughs> He's everywhere. He's everywhere. Mr. Hinton. Yes, they contacted Mr. Hinton. That's what they told me. That was in their plan. That they were going to talk to Mr. Jepson, Mr. Hinton. <laughs> awesome. So I'm so proud of these kids. Obviously, with the help, support, and guidance of their amazing teacher, Catherine Hewitt. Um, but they noted this is exactly the call to action that we want for our students, right? Notice a problem, research some solutions, and then put it into place. And so for the past three weeks now, we've been um, these kids went to every single lunch and did this presentation for the student body. Um, then they volunteered to do like the tray helper job, which is a really hard and messy job. What started 
this whole process um, that they were frustrated by it and thought that they could make it better. Um, so they volunteered to do that and they've been um, collecting the milk cartons, recycling them, and not only that, but they're keeping track of how much weight that we're keeping out of the landfill and how much money that saves the district because we pay for our garbage um, by the pound. So they're doing all this research, data, graphing. I mean, it has turned into such a huge, authentic project um, and really a service learning project for them. And it was from a real problem that they noticed and they wanted to you know, step up and make it better. So um, those are the kids that we have and they're our future, right? And they're the ones that we're um, preparing this budget for and supporting um, and, and making, paving the way. They're doing an amazing job. So I'm very, very proud of them. Thank you for taking the time to watch that. Thank you. And, thank you. and you could find everyday evidence like that in our schools um, on accident without even looking for it uh, from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. And that's also you might notice um, that our Facebook feed and our Twitter feed are much more vibrant with lots of everyday evidence. That's a concerted effort for us to really communicate um, with the community your return on investment. So then earlier I made the mention to the third leg of the table, the values. This has to be just as strong and just as sturdy. This is the behaviors. This is what we are going to commit to. And if you read this full document, which is available on our website, it speaks specifically to the role of the teachers, the leaders, the students, the parents, our essential operations. Um, those are the people who it's transportation, food service, right? We, um, and the community at large because it really does take all of us to ensure that we are making decisions and planning and instruction um, that is leading to continuous improvement for our schools. And that we're also thinking about individual students' needs while we're making these decisions and keeping them at the forefront of our final decisions. So this year we have three district SMART goals and if you know that acronym, it stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Realistic, Rigorous. I think two things for the R, and time bound. Um, and we've really been working with our district goal number one to create this district-wide system of continuous improvement. And so we use a data-wise model to guide our work as our, as our framework. And it's really, in a simplified version, this plan, do, um, check, or study, and act. And so that means when we make um, improvement plans, that we then assess them, we test them before we implement them, we do them, we collect data, much like the students at Wentworth are doing with their improvement plan. Um, then we study that data and we compare it to what, what happened to what we predicted. Our students are actually doing this, right? Um, and then we glean insights for the next cycle, and then we act, we decide. Are we gonna continue this? Are we gonna scale it up across the district as they hope that's part of their prediction, right? Do we need to abandon the idea? Do we need to make adjustments? Um, and so that's our district-wide goal. We're all working towards that in a variety of ways. District goal two is all about organizing ourselves for collaboration. And when we talk about collaboration, we truly think about co-laboring toward common goals. Um, and this is really the first step of that data-wise process that I talked to about earlier. And you know, frankly, these could be our district goals for the next five plus years, I think. We'll constantly be honing this skill set. Um, and then the third goal was asking of the, each building to design a SMART goal that would directly meet the needs of their students. And the idea with these district goals is that they're intentionally brought at the district level, and then as you get to the building, um, to the teacher, individual classroom, to the individual student, they become more and more specific. So there's our four legs of the table. With all that being nice, solid, and firm, um, then we can move forward and carry the heavy load, which is the work that our teachers and our leaders do each and every day. Kate, do you want to talk a little bit about the budget goal? Would you like to breathe? <laughs> I'm all excited. That video got me all jazzed. I know. That was wonderful. Love seeing the kids making a difference. Um, so our budget proposal goals, uh, when we get together as a leadership team and start talking about building a budget, uh, first of all, it's everyone's favorite job, right? I mean, it's, it's the most fun that we have uh, together. But really, the, the first thing that we think about is prioritizing resources. Um, there's never a big enough pie for everybody to do all the things that we agree are absolutely important. So we end up spending a lot of time talking about those incremental differences between what's slightly more important than something else. Um, so when we are hearing from people tonight with their passions about uh, what's on the list and what's not on the list, 
please know that we put them on the list. We put all of them on the list. And so now we're just juggling what's going ahead of what and what we can afford to do. Uh, the second thing is to provide required and appropriate services based on student needs. And um, when we say required and appropriate, there are services that need to be provided to all students um, to ensure that all students can access education, uh, which means a, a number of different things across the district, but it definitely uh, relates to the individual student needs, and those change every year, and the kids come and go, and their needs change, and so we're very responsive to that, and we're paying attention to that as we create our budget. This year, particularly, and last year as well, we're responding to increasing enrollment demands at K2. Uh, we've had uh, those enrollment numbers that Julie flashed up there earlier. And we've been watching very carefully. Uh, we've had some growth at K2 already this year. We've added some staff this year. And uh, that picture continues to develop and we're continuing to see folks coming in. We have early enrollment. That's much higher than what we had been having in the past. And uh, so in our budget proposal, those of you who have been listening the last couple of days will know that we've had a lot of conversations about what's needed at the K2 level, including uh, building space. Meanwhile, we need to maintain our existing programs and we need to talk about student safety. Um, so we're always looking out for the health and well-being of the students um, and some of our facilities conversations have had to do with that as well. Um, a couple of things that we've been focused on at the high school and that we've uh, created some investments to address are one, uh, some of the uh, things that, uh, that Joanna shared with us earlier this evening about the Career Pathways program. Um, such an exciting and wonderful opportunity for our kids and something that needs to grow and there are some resources in our budget that are going to address that growth and to move that pilot into uh, a real and thriving program for our students. The 21st century piece uh, really kind of refers to uh, tech and engineering and what we call STEM or STEAM. Uh, we have a very robust and vigorous program of STEM education now that's built up from uh, even the kindergarten level all the way up through eighth grade. And we've had dedicated teachers and resources. We have some amazing new STEM labs at Wentworth School. Um, and we've got a lot going on K through eight. And at the high school, we've asked the science and mathematics staff to step up and offer some new courses, but we have never actually invested in a STEM or engineering teacher uh, or in some of the classroom supports that we would need to make that program really vigorous and really vibrant. So our worry is that students are coming up through eighth grade and getting excited and encouraged and excited about doing perhaps tech or engineering and then at the high school level, they may not have the resources to keep that spark alive and to get them out into the working world or into higher education. Uh, the last item on the list I'm going to give to Julie. <laughs> this is because Kate doesn't want to advocate for herself. Um, I think that most people in our district would be really surprised to, or in our community, to learn that an organization of our size, we have over 500 employees supporting almost 3,000 students, does not have a dedicated HR specialist, a human resource specialist. Um, that is Kate, um, and a little bit of Monique, and a little bit of Joanne, and I do a little bit, and our principals do a little bit, um, but we really feel that our staff deserves uh, full attention of an HR specialist, and so that is something that um, Kate, you know, selflessly would put low, lower on the budget just to get the conversation started. But we, um, as the leadership council, said this is this isn't sustainable. We really need to um, start the conversation now with our community, and our hope is that it would end up making the um, the final budget by by round two, second reading. But it, you'll see it in the first reading here as well. And one thing you'll notice if you are thinking back or if you looked back at last year's presentation just to prepare for tonight, you would notice that our goals last year was really to have a maintenance budget. We didn't ask for anything new last year. It was all required and basic services because we understood the revenue gap that we had. This year we don't have a revenue gap, but we have some glaring needs that have been put off um, for too long and so you'll see us advocating for those needs but you'll also hear that there are still some unmet needs um, and that really leads us to talking about what are the budget challenges that we have this year and so 
I think our number one challenge is the, the town council budget goal of 3% or less. Um, this goal is set well before we've even had the opportunity to fully assess all of our needs, and that poses challenges for us. We also have increasing K-2 enrollment. Um, we have space challenges at Eight Corner School. I just walked around Pleasant School today with Principal Steele, and we have space challenges there. Um, and we're getting tight and having space challenges at Blue Plain School as well. The, the most emergent issue we have is that we literally do not have enough classrooms at the Eight Corner School for the students who we know are already registered and coming to school there. Um, so we have a separate um, project that we've proposed some funding outside of the budget um, through the town council, and we had that presentation last night, and they'll be voting on it on May 10th. April 10th. Our fourth or third challenge is um, really an opportunity, um, but it does pose us to think creatively, is the developmental, social, emotional, and behavioral needs of our students are um, increasing. We're seeing more and more students coming to us requiring specialized services, and that means that we need more resources, and we need to give our staff um, new training, new knowledge, new skills so that they can best serve our students. And then, of course, I mean, this is obvious to all of you who are in the room, we have more needs and investment proposals than we're able to support. Um, and part of that goes to the first bullet, but it also goes to the, the last several years of us having really, really tight budgets. And if you look at Scarborough School budget over the last 10 years, um, which Kate and I have done a lot, you'll see that we, we're tight, we're tight, we're tight, big bump, right, in terms of investments. And then we go back to budgeting really tight, really tight, really tight, and then big bump. We don't think that's sustainable. We think that Scarborough needs to be committed as a whole community into making incremental investments year after year so you don't have these um, you know, peaks and valleys in, in your budgeting and in your tax asks. Would you add to that? Or? Uh, I would say, I think somewhere down the line in the slide presentation, there's a conversation about minimum receivership. And, and one of the things that, that what that means, we'll go into a little bit later, but. Uh, it means that our state subsidy has sort of bottomed out and we were only getting the minimum amount by statute. But the, the nice thing about that, if there is something nice about getting six cents on the dollar from the state, is that it's predictable. And so if you're talking about having predictable incremental growth and investment in your operating budget, you can also talk about incremental growth in your funding that comes from the state to support that. So a little something for you to think about. Our incoming kinder kindergartners are members of the class of 2032. Mm -hmm. Wrap your mind around that. Mm -hmm. So that means they'll be graduating from Scarborough High School in the year 2032. What that also means for, for me is that I have no idea, I can't even begin to imagine what the world will look like in 2032. So my daughter's five, she's part of the class of 2032. And my husband and I often catch her saying things um, like yesterday when she said, Mommy, can you, what is it called when, you're, when it's not on demand, when you just turn the TV on and there's a show? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, well, that's, that's TV, that's local TV. <laughs> So, and it, my husband said, well, this is like a phone. Like, she's not going to have any idea what a phone is. And you've seen those videos that have gone viral, right, with teenagers trying to use a rotary phone. It's like having an analog watch, right? Like, what is that? Well, they're kind of coming back. Okay. Um, <laughs> Retro. <Retro. laughs> so this is something I just want to get you thinking about, again, because this is the budget. Like, each budget we create has to address the needs of the students that we serve and the reality that is going to be their, their future. And so we can think back to the industrial age where it was all about efficiency, working nine to five, doing a singular task, lots of repetition, right? This is what our schools used to look like and we're trying to really unlearn that and disrupt that through, um, through each budget cycle with the investments that we make. Then we have the information age, the empowered age. This was when you know, we started processing data. Well, today we're talking about the, in the experienced age. Students don't want to be engaged. They're not interested in being engaged. They want to be invested. You heard that here, right, when our student was talking about her passion. She wants to create, right? Yeah. You want to collaborate. You don't, you're not interested in being lectured to, are you? No, students. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the age that our students are in, and we're calling this the fourth industrial revolution. 
I hadn't heard this term. Have, have you all heard this term? You should Google it. The fourth industrial revolution. This is what we're, these are the challenges our students are facing. And I'm not gonna read this slide to you, but I just wanna bring your attention to, you know, water and steam, first industrial revolution. Electricity, second industrial revolution. Automation, third. Here we are in the fourth revolution, industrial revolution, and we're talking about cyber and physical systems. Any idea what that means? Nobody has a guess? Cyber and physical systems? You, how many of you have an Alexa or a smartphone that you talk to and it talks back to you? That's cyber and physical um, systems. How many of you uh, have a car that has some sort of safety mechanism that keeps you staying in your lane or helps you prevent you from getting into an accident? That's cyber and physical systems. Automated cars. I just saw something today. 10 million, was it 10 million driverless cars on the road by 2020? That's next year. 10 million cars on the road. And so when we think about this, and we think about 47% of US jobs are at risk for automation, um, the good news is it's gonna create new jobs, right? I think we saw something like eight, 113 jobs will be created by robots, 8.8 .8 million will be lost by robots, but then 113 created. So when we talk about the skills that students need, it's not about road information. It's not about knowledge and facts. They can Google it on their phone in three seconds. Um, so we don't need to spend our time in schools doing that. We need to spend our times creating thinkers. And that means that we need students who are flexible and that they're, they have skills to reinvent themselves. The average um, st student today, millennial today, not, not even a student, is going to have eight to 11 different careers. I think this, the stats are something like that. Um, so it's not this idea that you're gonna step into one job and that's gonna be your career. Deep problem solving and, and deep critical thinking skills. Right, you saw that in our Wentworth students today. We don't need people to be problem solvers, we want them to be problem seekers. We have a big problem with our environment. We need these kids to be ready to help us handle that. High levels of creativity, computer and data sciences, materials, science, and engineering. And so you're gonna see things in this budget that are asking, um, that we're asking for that help us ensure that our kids in Scarborough have these skills. So this is one of my favorites. I use this all the time, year after year. Um, this is the, these are the skills and attributes of today's learner. Um, I've been talking about this for a decade, so it's not really new news, but we're still in public schools working to try to ensure that each and every learner, both young and adult, have these skills. And so the types of things that we're talking about here are the types of things that Christy Zavaznik, our internship coordinator at the high school and Spanish teacher, is hearing from the workforce. This is what they want from their interns. This is what they're looking for in their future employees. Critical thinkers, problem solvers, effective oral and written communicators, collaboration across networks, adaptability, agility, um, able to respond to changes, grit, perseverance, resilience, empathy, global stewardship, thinking bigger than just your community, self-regulation, vision, hope and optimism, curiosity and imagination, initiative and entrepreneurship. Goes back to that fourth industrial revolution. We're talking about creating creators, developing collaborators. collaborators. So now is when Kate gets to tell you about minimum receivership. Mm -hmm. All of that is really to set the stage for you though to be thinking about how urgent our work is. This is, you know, this is life changing work that we do. And so um, we want you to keep that in mind and in your heart as you hear about our budget ask this year. So yeah, I, I would echo what Julie's saying and, and she says it much more eloquently than I do, but I, I think the, the key takeaway is that we, we don't educate kids in a certain way because we think that's interesting or fun or, or it's you know a cool idea that we heard somewhere. What we're doing is looking around us and seeing what grown-up life needs and what grown-up life is going to demand of these kids. And um, so it's, it's our um, sacred trust to get you guys to that point with the skills and the attributes and the abilities that you're going to need to be successful. So then, minim minimum receivership. What I was saying earlier, and yeah, back to boring numbers and statutes. Uh, what I was saying earlier about minimum receivership, um, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. There's a lot of numbers on the slide, and you all can read them. But uh, basically what happens is the state of Maine delivers subsidy, general purpose aid, school funding, a lot of different names for the same thing, for K-12 education to each community in the state. And depending on the 
prosperity and size of that community, the state aid can be anywhere from 80% of their budget to 6% of their budget, or zero, <laughs> close to zero. Uh, Scarborough happens to be, compared with other districts in the state of Maine, uh, a very prosperous town, and we're doing very well, we're, we're, we're growing, and uh, we're thriving, and we're economically strong, and as a result, the state formula is saying to Scarborough, you really don't need as much money as some of these other towns do. What you need to do is to reach into your own pockets because y'all can afford it. Um, minimum receivership is a statute that says there's really a bottom line to what the state can say they can give us. Um, they are not allowed to just say, oh, Scarborough, you're on your own. There's a minimum amount that they have to deliver to this community. Um, and it's based on a couple of different um, calculations in the statute, and in our case, the calculation that makes uh, Scarborough subsidy come through is 45% of our special education costs from two years prior. Um, so the point of this slide is that we get very little support from the state of Maine, and we get a great deal of support from our local taxpayers, because we don't really have other revenue streams. Uh, and. Um, as I said earlier, the, the, the nice thing, if there is a nice thing about getting very little money from the state, is that under this, the minimum receivership statute, you can predict exactly, or at least very closely, what you're gonna receive from, from year over year. And um, so we don't have any worries about losing subsidy. Over the last 10 years, we lost um, approximately $4 million in subsidy. We lost about 62% of our subsidy since 2009. So it's nice to be at the bottom, and there's nowhere to go but up. Um, there is one really important bullet at the end of this about um, the regionalization efforts, which sounds like a lot of jargon. Um, Question one. But it's really important because the voters of Scarborough are yeah. going to need to have uh, a positive vote in referendum. On question one. On question, on question one. On the June ballot, when we're voting in the referendum to pass the school budget, we're also going to be voting for membership in the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, which is a group of regional school districts that are collaborating on a number of things. And I'll let Julie talk about that just for a sec. Um, okay, talk about it later. Um, but the big news is that if we join the Greater Sebago Educational Alliance, we will receive that $83,000 that you see on that bottom line. If we don't join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, we don't get the money. Um, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There was $46,000 in our budget this year that was due to come from the state, but because that referendum failed at the polls last November, the state of Maine said, okay, we'll take that $46,000 back. Um, and, you know, $46,000, that could be, hey, uh, an ed tech, or all kinds of wonderful things. Half a teacher. <laughs> Which half? <laughs> uh, so it's really important, and, and I want y'all to go out and tell all your friends and neighbors that Greater Sebago Education Alliance is a wonderful thing, and Julie will tell you why. Question one. Thumbs up. All right, now we'll share with you the bottom line, and then we'll kind of work backwards from the bottom line to show you what goes into the budget to get us there. And so here's our proposed school budget this year. Um, what you see in the first line is our general fund operating budget, think expenses, right? Then we have two other um, budgets that are not included in our operating budget, um, but do have an impact on the tax rate, which is adult education and school nutrition. Um, then our total education budget, you'll see here, so this is our gross spending. Um, again, this is our expenditures, how much are we choosing to invest in our students, is at 6.35%. Then we add in the non-tax revenues, so that's that 3.3 million from the state that Kate talked about. It's the um, participation fees that folks pay in town. Yeah, there's a number of miscellaneous um, revenues that we collect that amount to just under $600,000. And then the rest of that 5.8 that you see there under um, the uh, non-tax revenue total is what we call fund balance, which is some uh, leftover surplus from prior years that we typically allocate to the next year as revenue. And so that makes the bottom line, or the net budget, 
um, which is the one that is our tax ask. And remember, this isn't your tax rate because you have to add school ask to town ask and divide that by the value of our town to get at what will be your tax rate or your mill rate. That's 5.71%. And so this is lower than it has been, I think, in the last three years, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, but yet, there are some new investments that we're really excited about in this budget. So uh, one of the questions that comes to mind when you're trying to read a school budget document, which, by the way, is what, 132 pages or something of that that length. Don't be intimidated by the page numbers. There's amazing, beautiful pictures oh, of our children. Yeah, it's it's so uh, such an easy take read. Up a lot of space. There's so, lots of fast, such a fun great facts read. in there. And um, this year, our leadership team did some research to also align some of their investment requests and their successes to what the research says. So you definitely want to read it. So this is just a quick chart that shows you um, where the money goes. Where where do those tax dollars go? Um, where does that the revenue go to. And as you can see from the chart, 79.1% of our budget goes to salaries, wages, and benefits, which means that people are our greatest resource. Uh, they're our greatest expenditure, but they are what makes us who we are, and they're who, who get the job done. Um, the, other, the next biggest slice is debt service, um, and that is the payments that we make on debt that we've incurred in prior years. Um, that can be for capital projects like roofs and floors and walls and windows, but it's um, also for buildings. So, for example, there's some money that's going to pay debt on the beautiful new Wentworth building in that. Um, and then you can read yourself down the, down the side there um, what other kinds of things we are spending money on. Um, and I, I think that the big story to take away from this one slide is that there's, there's really not a whole lot of what you would call discretionary spending, um, where you, know, you would have a choice whether you would buy something or not buy something. Um, you know, obviously, you've got to keep your buses on the road. You've got to put fuel in them. You've got to pay the light bills so that there's uh, lights and heat in the, in the buildings. Uh, so you, you sort of run down and you look for things where there's a lot of ability to wiggle and uh, there's really not that, not that much in there. And so I'm just gonna point out two sad points. So here's our people, our most valuable resource. We are a people organization, we people serving people. This is how much we've invested in professional development, 0.3% of our budget. And then when we talk about discretionary, this is the amount of money combined across all of our departments, 1.8% of our budget on supplies and equipment to do our job of instructing students. So because personnel is our most valuable and largest investment, we also here break down um, what that big piece of the pie is. So imagine zooming into that 79.1%. Right, to see, see what that's made up of. And I, I think this would be a good moment to say, as we're doing our song and dance about the budget book, that the budget book is on the budget portal, which is a website that's shared by the town and school. And um, there will be all kinds of documents posted up there electronically so people can take a look at it. We also have an actual book sitting on the counter upstairs if anyone wants to go up and read it. Uh, usually people read the newspaper when they come in, but the budget book is far more interesting. Um, so the distribution of personnel costs, when you take that 79.1% of the budget, that's made up of human beings, their salaries and their benefits. Thanks, guys. Um, this breaks it down so that you can see who are those people. And um, as you can see, again, you've got a big blue chunk on the right, and those are our teachers and professionals. And when we say professionals, um, that's sort of a generic term for folks like guidance counselors and school nurses and therapists and uh, folks who belong to the teacher group but aren't exactly a classroom teacher. Um, then you've got the other chunks of folks wrapping around the side there. The second biggest group is the educational support staff. Uh, so those are your ed techs and folks that are working in the classrooms, mostly with the kiddos. Um, and then uh, works its way on around to the other groups. Is there anything we want to point out there, Julie? Just, yep. that's just how it all breaks out. Yep. So now we get to talk about the items that are still in motion. 
Remember earlier we said that we build this budget um, without having all of the information yet, kind of like an algebraic formula. That's for April. <laughs> um, so the first thing I'll talk about is that regional service center membership. Um, so this is something that really has existed for uh, well over, what, two decades, Joe? Um, and we, we've done this on our own for a number of years, looking for efficiencies. Where can we share services? Um, how can we co uh, collaborate around professional development and essential trainings for our staffs? Um, but two years ago, the state said that and we're going to change the way we calculate system administration within that big formula that spits out our general purpose aid number that Kate talked about earlier. And they said we're going to fund system administration less, but we're going to incentivize you to join or to form a regional service center. Um, and so we started talking with our colleagues in the Sebago Education Alliance and we said, what can we do that makes sense? Because we want to do something that's truly going to bring efficiencies to our district. We know we're already doing this really well. Um, and we went through the application process, really honing in on um, two major categories, which were um, sharing professional development and specifically developing a leadership academy um, and food service purchasing. Um, and then we part, and then other districts started to join our um, Sebago Education Alliance, and we became the Greater Sebago Educational Alliance. Um, and we now have Portland, um, South Portland, South Portland um, Brunswick, uh, Freeport is a part of this group. And so Scarborough's been at the table from day one, but we're the only ones who haven't joined yet. Um, so it's really important that the voters come out and support um, both question ones this year, the budget, and to join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance. And the stakes are higher this year. It's double. Last year it was like 46000 This year it's 83000 For the purpose of calculating the budget, we're using a number, um, an estimated number of 80000 So this truly is more than just one teaching position uh, if our voters say yes. So uh, one of the uh, issues that we have when we set the budget for first reading is that um, we have a lot of question marks about what our costs are actually going to be. We have a lot of estimates in place. And typically by the time we get to the second reading of the budget, which this year is going to be in the middle of May, we have a lot more information about those things. Um, and you'll see a couple of the next two bullets are about insurance rates. And insurance, our insurance plans go from July to June each year. They tie with our fiscal year. And so um, we don't actually get our renewal rates until April for Anthem. Anthem's got its own bullet because Anthem uh, health insurance is the health insurance that we have for our whole district. And uh, because we're a big district and because we have so many people and so many people with health insurance, it's a big cost driver for us. And so this, it says we've estimated it a 7% increase, and um, one percentage point is about $54,000. So it makes a difference um, whether we have our rates come in at 7% or whether they come in at 6 or, uh, or where they land, or if they come in at 8. They came in higher last year than what we estimated. Um, other insurance premiums, dental, workers' comp, property casualty. We're in negotiations with all of these folks right now, waiting for renewal rates to come through. And so what happens from first reading to second reading is that a lot of those numbers land, and then we have real numbers that we can put into the second reading budget. So um, it's pretty much an annual exercise to go from first reading to second reading with adjustments in those areas. The next couple of bullets are about people, students, and student needs. And we've already talked a little bit about uh, kindergarten enrollment and those needs. We have uh, special education students who are coming in now. And we're assessing the needs of those children. Um, and we're, we're basically trying to calculate what it's going to cost to provide the services for all of these new children. Um, and uh, there are also some unexpected special education costs. I think that uh, one of the things that, that's a challenge in special education, and Allison speaks very eloquently about that when we get together, is, is that it's such an uncertain area because you really never know uh, what child is going to need what service at, at, at any moment. And uh, you know, obviously we're completely obligated to provide what the child needs, and sometimes that comes with additional costs. The last bullet is collective bargaining, and um, as many of you may know, we are in negotiations right now with our teachers union. That's our largest bargaining unit. 
uh, which you could tell because that was that big blue swoop on, on the pie chart. Um, and <coughs> since we don't have a um, bargaining agreement with a salary table for next year, what we do is we, we guesstimate and we put an amount in the budget right now, which we think is gonna be sufficient to pay those folks next year, but we don't have actual numbers that we can rely on, and we hope to be able to refine that a little bit as the negotiations continue and we have more of an idea of where they're going to be landing. So outside of um, the tax ask and the non-tax revenues that we receive, we also receive a lot of creative funding um, from a variety of sources. This by no means is an exhaustive list, but um, those of you who are, have children in the schools, you know that you support our school programs in many different ways, providing basic supplies, field trip fees, laptop fees, activity fees, parking fees. Um, those are things that you know we don't necessarily feel great about. I, I would think I could speak for the board about having to put them in place, but they are necessary in order for us to um, contribute to offer the level of services that we do. I think my long-range vision for Scarborough would be that we would find a way to fund that through the budget process and all students would have full access and opportunity um, to engage in clubs and sports and um, field trips. We do offer waivers for those who, who are financially unable, but um, I believe deeply that students um, often self-select out because they don't either want to go through the process or they don't want to burden their families. And when I think about that, it makes me very worried um, about what opportunities they might be missing out on. We also have tons of community support um, for our school programs. I'm sure all of you get hit up by fundraisers all the time. Um, it's a good way to meet students in our district when they come knocking on your door. Um, but we also have a lot of volunteers in the district, local grants like you heard about tonight, donations, which you're gonna hear about in a little bit, um, our school business partners. We have a Feinberg Trust for our Arts Council. Um, and then of course, one of our biggest supporters is the Scarborough Education Foundation, literally providing thousands of dollars of innovation grants to our teachers each and every year. And we're so grateful for that. It gives our teachers a lot of motivation to think outside of the box. So one of the many things that I appreciate about Kate, and I would even say love about Kate, is that I can go into her office <coughs> with like an idea, and I'm like a mad scientist with my arms waving in the air, and I'm like, I think we need something that will show this. And so this has been something I've been talking about this year that she pulled together today just so I could share it with you. Um, and what this document shows is all of the investment proposals that our principals and our directors have made in the green bar that you see up here. And then the blue is what gets into the first reading. And then the orange is what makes it to the approved budget um, after the voters say yes to the budget. And so if you look at FY17, um, this was the first year that I was in the district, so I, I didn't have the benefit of being a part of developing this budget with the team, but here was the ask. Our team said we need these things. Here's what we, through our own internal prioritization process, um, which takes lots of hours and time and collaboration, K-12, said we are gonna bring forward for first reading to start the conversation, and then that year, it made it, made it right through, at least the dollar value made it right through to the, the second reading. Um, and so real quick, I'll just show you. So here's FY18, again, proposals. This is your leadership saying, here's what we need with input from staff and community. <coughs> here's what went into first reading. Here's what made it to the final approved budget um, in terms of dollars. And these are new investments above and beyond um, the level services budget. So here was last year, FY19. Again, we knew we had to have a maintenance budget, so we didn't come forward asking much asking for much beyond required services. Kate mentioned that our anthem rates were higher than we had projected last year, so we had to go back into our budget. We didn't ask for more monies. We reduced um, our first reading in order to get that budget approved for the first time on the first vote. So that was really exciting for us. This year, um, the, this was our ask of our leadership team. Again, you know, you see the theme sort of when you ask for less, ask for less, ask for less, here's the bubble. You see that when you look at that 10 year review as well. And this is what we're bringing forward. What we don't know yet is what will be finally approved. That is ultimately up to the town council first and then you all as the voters. Um, and so getting out the vote is really important. And then down below, this will be posted online, um, shows you that in actual figures and then percent over the total budget proposed. 
So this next um, series of slides that you're going to see was my waving arms in the air idea from last year that Kate created for us. And this has become my favorite tool to talk about what's in the budget and what's not. Um, there are some copies of it up here, so you, if you want to grab a full set, you're welcome to that. And I believe, board members, you all have this if you want to follow along. Um, and so, Kate, feel free to jump in. But the way that this tool works is that Kate starts by saying, okay, what were the budget totals last year? What were the non-tax revenues? And what was the school portion of the tax request? So that's FY19 final approved budget. And I'll spend a little bit more time on this slide, just the few sli first few slides, just to show you how they work. And then we'll move along and explain what we're asking for. Um, so this first green bar is what we call level services. And in the past, we called this status quo. In the past, we said this means shutting the doors in June and opening them up in um, August. And what we realized was that was really selling our team short. Because what happens within this green box, hypothetically, um, actually, but metaphorically, is that each of our principals meets with Kate, myself, Monique, and Joanne, and they advocate line by line for what they need within their budget. Um, we look at, are there areas where we can reduce? Are there efficiencies we can find? Can we reallocate? Um, and we ask really hard questions of our principals and our directors, um, like, well, where's the evidence that supports that that's an actual need? What evidence do you have that those are the actual costs? And they, they put a lot of time into coming to that two-hour meeting with us to explain that. Um, so that, that this includes that line item review, um, and the reallocation to meet current needs. So when you're looking at these boxes, you'll see over here the proposed amount. Then you go across, it's the dollar amount change from FY19 approved. And then it's the gross, the top is always going to be gross, um, percent change over the FY, the previous year FY19 approved, right? So then this should be static or non-tax revenues on each side. And then it says, OK, so now when we take this, we minus this, what do we get in terms of our net ask? What's the dollar amount change over last year? And what's the percent amount change over last year? And so what's unique about this slide this year is that our gross um, percent change is higher than usual. And it's higher than usual because of that collective bargaining process that's underway with our largest bargaining unit. Right? So we have to be able to budget in a way that allows our school board to negotiate um, in good faith. Right? So the explanation for that is just what I said before. Um, and these are the things that happen. And so we've estimated this. Uh, principals and directors might have a different number. But we've estimated it to be about 20 hours of work to analyze current budget needs, shift, and reallocate resources. So from there, now you're going to see, again, here's that level services budget that was on the first slide. And then here's the next step, if you will. This is where um, Kate goes in and analyzes all of our personnel. She looks very closely at um, who's retiring, what are the shifts in personnel, do we know that folks are leaving us? And she calculates for what um, is called breakage or turnover reductions. And so again, now you see the percent change. Here's our gross, and here's our net. We're closer to 3% here on the net. And I would just drop in on that, that when we have folks who retire, uh, what we experience typically is that if a person retires, they're usually at the top of the salary scale. And then when we hire a replacement for that person, in most cases, we're not hiring someone that's at the, at the very top of the scale. So there's typically a little bit of a change uh, and a little bit of a savings for folks that we are um, that we know are going to be leaving the district. And without going too far in the weeds, even though we're calling this level services, no new investments doesn't mean there's no new ideas. And one example I would highlight um, is a new course that's going to be offered at Scarborough High School next year, which really was driven by one of our eighth grade students who um, sent me an email and then met with the principal and met with our director of curriculum and said, I really feel like we need a course at Scarborough High School that teaches us how to adult. Like adulting is a verb now. Um, and they are saying, she was saying, that we need this. Like we want to learn about personal finance. We want to learn how to navigate in today's world. And so one of our existing teachers 
is actually going to be offering and teaching that course. And I'm pretty sure that it's gonna fill up quickly if it hasn't already. I don't know where we are in that process. So it says no new investments, but that's not no new ideas. We are always trying to think creatively on how to use our resources best. And it goes back to that first budget goal back in the beginning of the slide. So that's just what I said to you before. Okay, so now we're gonna have, here's that breakage retirement slide, so those numbers are the same. And here's where we talk about our required services. So now you see the ask here, you didn't see this on the other slide, you saw the reduction of 123,005 here. Now, this is a required investment. And so when we look at our proposals, um, our principals and directors write up a full proposal with justification and they even try to identify funding sources. We then as a leadership team, um, prioritize those and we have four categories required which means non-negotiable it has to happen um, high medium and low and we work through a, a multi-phase process to really take those proposals and then rank them and so you're seeing those rankings here but always first and foremost it's required services <coughs> this is not a choice you can't ask us to reduce this. Well, I guess you could ask us to reduce this, but you'd probably end up spending just as much money in legal fees because we wouldn't be meeting minimum requirements and expectations for our students, and that certainly wouldn't align to our mission or our vision. And so although this number is large this year, um, remember that it's required. So it's compliance, it's mandates, and it's safety. This is responding to incoming students. This year, we know we have the highest number of incoming kindergartners already identified through CDS, which is Child Development Services, than we have ever had, um, and enough ever in, in the history of Scarborough, at least as far back as our institutional memory goes, which is far. Um, and it also allows us to develop appropriate programming and services for those students, which often requires people. Um, some of these students will be coming in with IEPs that already say they need to have one-to-one -one supports, um, and that often is in the form of an ed tech position. So these are nine new ed techs that will need to be added to our district. If you know anyone who wants to be an ed tech, let us know, because they're always hard to find. Um, we also need another special ed teacher based on the, in, the incoming enrollment numbers that we see and know are coming. Um, we need some supplies for that teacher. Whenever you add a teacher, we want to make sure they have the resources. Um, this is a split investment um, between the high school budget and the special education budget. It's a social worker to better support our students. And then with all of these needs comes a lot of paperwork. Um, it's really critical that we are in compliance with the law um, and what it says in terms of notification to parents, um, making sure that meetings are happening in a timely way, and that paperwork right now is being done by our consultant teachers, and it's really taking away from the work that they can be do, doing and supporting our students. Hop in if I'm missing anything. Okay, so now we've gotten past the level services and the requirements, and we start to talk about the investments. And again, as Julie said, there are proposals that are very uh, detailed and written out by our, um, by our leadership team. And when we first get together and talk about these proposals, we do sort of the elevator pitch thing, and everybody goes around the room and says, well, I've, I've got a proposal here that says that I'd like to have a .75 transportation office support specialist, and I, I, I'm going to tell you why that's important. And, and, and we'll go around the room and we'll each get a chance to make our pitch and talk about why something is important at our phase or our building or our department. And then the rest of the group will weigh in and start talking about where that fits in uh, K-12, district-wide. You know, where, where do those priorities land when, when they're compared with everyone else's? And so this is one that emerged at the top of our list. And um, fortunately, unfortunately, with our uh, shortage of bus drivers this year, we were able to, um, we needed to bring someone in to support the office, the transportation office, because Sarah, who's our transportation supervisor, has been driving every day. Um, and so families were calling the bus barn, um, and no one was there to answer their call. 
And you can imagine if your little one didn't get where they needed to on any certain day, that's not a good feeling to call and not have someone there to answer. Um, so through our subline, we were able to fund this person on a part-time basis. And when we came together as a leadership team, the principals were like, that has got to stay. Like this has been hugely important and helpful. The other challenge that we have is um, central office closes at four, although sometimes, most of the time, we're around. Um, we're not always answering the phones because we're in meetings and things like that. And so it was even hard for principals who might have a transportation need. There was no one for them to connect with. So this became our number one highest priority investment. And you can see in the grand scope of things, it's little money for student safety. Um, big return on investment. And then I'll just highlight here, this is what it's doing to the gross, 5%. And this is the net because the first time in a few years, we have additional revenue. We don't have a big gap. So this number in last year was going up every time you'd look at the net because we had that gap, right? The second priority, um, again, not a huge investment, but an essential investment. One of the things Kate and I did this year that was a new addition to our process was we went out in December during lunches at each of the schools and we made ourselves available to our teachers and our staff. And we said, we're just gonna be here to listen to what you wanna share with us about your budget priorities, um, what's working well for you, what are you not, um, what's not working well. And one of the things we heard loud and clear from Wentworth was that we don't have, we don't have adequate supplies. And so when we went back and we looked at the budget across the, the individual school um, discretionary spending around instructional supplies, we saw um, disproportionality at Wentworth comparative to the other schools. And so this corrects that. Um, it also responds to our teacher's voice um, and ensures that they have the necessary minimum supplies that they need um, to do their work. And of course, as you know, parents, we still ask you for help with that. Um, so the first investment, again, provides that essential communication. It also, um, and, and this is just sort of the justification that I talked a little bit um, on the previous slide, just so that you can see it and have it. If you're looking back at the slide deck after tonight's meeting, we wanted you to have the narrative. But it seems easier to talk about it when the numbers are here. Um, so the next, oops, the next um, priority investment here is responding to our increasing enrollment. Um, so you can see it's still a high priority. That's how it was ranked by the team. Um, the grand total is $310,000. And I'll talk a bit about what that, um, what that includes on the next slide. Here's that gross impact and here's the net. So the idea behind this is that you're literally seeing the incremental investment that gets to our total budget proposal. The second one here, as we've talked about this a bunch tonight, um, can't celebrate and advocate for this enough. We have an amazing teacher doing amazing work with students um, who are enrolled in the internship class, but that's not all that she's been doing. She's been inviting folks in to do job talks and really um, connecting students to um, day trips that they can go out into the workforce and um, experience different career opportunities. And the vision for this is much grander than what we're actually able to realize today. Um, and so we think it's essential to make this investment. This is also the third year in a row that we've been asking for this position. So we feel like the time has come for us to step up as a community, especially when we have um, businesses and individual community members taking money out of their pockets to make this work happen. We need to show our part and do um, have a good faith effort. So that became a high priority for us as well. So we're at investment, new investment number three and four. And the breakdown for K2, what we're anticipating is that each of our K2 schools will need at least one additional classroom teacher based on enrollment projections. Um, and already those enrollment projections are coming true um, given the work that the principals have done with pre-registration. They are at or above current enrollment numbers today before parent information night um, for next school year. And so we know that we're, we have this need. If we're adding teachers, we also have to add time to our part-time art teacher. She's currently two days a week. We would need her three days a week to ensure that all students have art. Um, and then we also have an ask for one more ed tech. And then when you have new teachers, you need new supplies. Um, and so that $3,000 calculation is part of this, 3,000 for each teacher um, to get all the necessary supplies. And then here's the career pathways position that we've been talking about. 
absolutely critical. We're way behind in Scarborough in terms of supporting this type of educational experience. So this, um, this investment actually has a budget neutral impact, but we wanted to pull it out as an example of um, the smart thinking that our principals are doing each and every year. We often get the question, have you tried to look for efficiencies um, when we talk about our budget? And so this is our principal at the middle school, Dr. Netto, um, identifying a, a need for students and also realizing that we have a retirement that's happening and a current ed tech position that could be reallocated in order to bring this teacher on board that would help support students who um, are at risk and in transition and need some extended supports. And so again, here's where we are in terms of our gross increase. Here's our net increase. We're at 5.37%. The next one is that STEM and engineering position um, that Kate talked about earlier. And again, you can see where we're growing in terms of the budget. So one additional teacher position has this level of impact on our budget. And just a little deeper explanation about those two things um, here available. So when you're coming back and reviewing this or you're talking to your friends and neighbors about why they should get out and vote for this budget, you have this information ready to share. And really, what's happening at the high school, um, without going in too much detail, is Kate mentioned that other teachers are taking on courses. Um, and, but what's also happening is we're having to turn students away because there is a high level of interest in these science, technology, engineering, and math courses that are being offered at Scarborough High School, but not every student who wants to take the classes are able to because we need an additional teacher to offer more, offer more sections. And we also have teachers who are not teaching, for example, biology or chemistry, because they're teaching as an engineering class, and, and that means that those courses may be oversubscribed. So we're, we're spreading, spreading the resources we have a little too thin. And that might work for a year or two years. It's been, I think, almost three years that we've been stretching resources at the high school, but everything has a tipping point, and we believe that we're at that tipping point at the high school this year. Um, the last thing that's above the red line, if you will, and remember that red line just means these are the things that we want our, our school board and our community to have really deep engaging conversations about. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be having them about things that are below the red line, but we had to draw the red line somewhere and promise me, I promise, listen, Believe me when I tell you that drawing that red line um, anywhere in this budget doesn't feel good. And we've moved it probably five or six times um, as we get to this point. But it's just the starting point. So this is that HR position that we talked about earlier. Um, again, the 500 plus employees with no current dedicated position to me is just unacceptable. And I don't believe that you could find another organization of our size. Um, with the type of structure that we have in terms of our central office support. So this brings our proposal um, that we're sharing tonight with the board and that we're asking for you to vote on. The gross is 6.14% and the net budget increase is 5.72%. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through all of these unfunded um, positions that are below the red line, but I will just speak to them. And as I do that, I have to, um, advocate for uh, our athletic director and for our principals and our directors that they don't decide what goes below the red line. They want it all to be above the red line. Trust me when I tell you. Um, and we have really hard, difficult conversations about that. And so that is really the work of the central <coughs> office leadership team and ultimately me. Um, making that decision to bring it forward to the board for first reading, knowing that things can flow in and out of the budget throughout the first reading to second reading process. But um, you should just know that no principal, no director um, is making that decision on their own. And they, they don't usually like the decision when I make it. <laughs> So these are our unmet needs, what we call unmet needs. Um, this year we were really hoping to be able to fund some um, national conferences and external professional development for our teachers to gain new knowledge and skills. The ask for that was 37.6. Um, didn't make it above the red line, but certainly an unmet need. Also in supporting the athletics department, we have a part-time administrative assistant. The ask was to increase her from point 
six to point eight, I believe, adding no, one more day to her point schedule. Four. Point four to point six. So point two is one day of the school week, um, and that's how we, you know, try to move things forward without inquiring the full cost. Some other unmet needs that we did still quantify again, so you can see what would the impact be of adding that. Um, and things like this feel kind of silly um, to have below the line, but adding another additional dance class to the high school has a cost, um, and some things have to go below the line. And so this was one that went below the line, but not because we don't have other ideas. Um, so Principal Ketch, being the innovative strategic thinker that she is, um, knows that students want to have a Dance 2 class. Right now we have two sections of Dance 1, so she's still going to look at student enrollment and see if there's enough interest for two Dance 1 classes, and if not, then she can offer one Dance 1 and one Dance 2 class with existing resources. Um, we were hoping to be able to add a third class, um, but that's not currently uh, a met need. Um, this is athletic safety equipment. So as most of you probably know, our sports boosters groups and our band boosters groups um, are very busy fundraising every year. They raise anywhere from three dollars to $500,000 to support our programs. And they, they actually are funding essential equipment, like safety equipment. We don't think that's acceptable. We think that we should be supporting essential safety equipment within our budget. Um, however, this year we don't know that, it doesn't appear that we can move the needle on that unless some things change from now until second reading. Um, but we have, we know that that equipment is still, um, we still have the possibility of working closely with boosters to get that equipment. So although it's not in the budget, meeting our long range strategic goal, um, we are hoping that our sports boosters will still be able to provide that for our students. Some more unmet needs. Um, Joanne and I currently share one amazing administrative assistant, Kelly Johnson. Um, I don't know how she does it, but I do worry, is that sustainable? She also supports the board. And I think that asking a lot of one person for a period of time, um, when you have someone like Kelly who goes above and beyond um, and puts in tons of hours, um, seems doable, but it certainly isn't sustainable. And I think that um, with your, when your new superintendent comes on board, they will feel much the same way, not because Kelly's not amazing and she doesn't do a great job supporting both Joanne and I and our crazy schedules, um, but it, I just don't think it's fair or sustainable. Then here's where we have unified basketball. Um, and this is not a good explanation, but the rationale was this is not a program that currently exists. Um, and we initially had this up at the very top of the budget under required services because we believe deeply that this is required and it is essential. Um, through budget conversations, it was moved lower on the priority list. Um, I'm excited to see the advocacy and the involvement from the community um, and making it very clear to us that this is a higher priority. Um, and I, I know that our board members feel much the same way. With this being said, um, Mike Legage is meeting with parents along with Allison Marchese, our Director of Special Services, and they are exploring grant opportunities, the possibility of creating a booster group, um, the possibility of seeking creative funding sources in other ways as well. And so um, don't give up hope, give us time. This is probably, I would say, one of those things that's still in motion, um, and we would like to see it happen for the next school year. Another program that falls um, and as a medium priority investment is alpine skiing. Um, this is a program that was brought to Scarborough, I think, uh, about a decade ago. It was something that was sanctioned by the board, but not financially supported by the board. Um, and this is why, you know, funding unified basketball um, through booster groups feels like a risk, feels like risky business because we have clear evidence right here with our alpine skiing program. Um, we had a really active booster group when it was first. Um, created, parents advocated for it. The board said, we'll sanction it, but we can't financially support it. They raised, I, I mean, the program costs about $40,000 a year, between thirty dollars and $40,000 a year. They were able to do that every year. They had a great ski sale every year. That was a, a robust fundraiser for them. And then as, their, as the parents who were highly involved, their students graduated out of Scarborough High School, the booster group sort of dissipated. Um, there's actually still $12,000 or $14,000 available in the Alpine Skiing Booster account 
um, but it's not enough to fund the program fully. And so in order for us to again ensure that if we're gonna offer it, we're gonna offer it in a sustainable way, we believe that it should be funded um, by the school department. Another unmet need is um, uh, advocacy and support for resources to support a new club that was created by students and a teacher volunteer this year called High School Sports Broadcasting. Um, if you've been to a basketball game or to one of our um, sporting events, I'm thinking basketball because I can see them sitting up on the top bleacher. Um, Dan Crowley, who's a new math teacher this year, um, along with several students, volunteered their time and used sort of piecemeal equipment that we had around to create a broadcasting activity, not yet a sanctioned club. We would like it to become sanctioned, which then requires through the collective bargaining agreement for us to pay the club advisor a stipend. Um, and then there's some essential equipment that they would need to really do that um, programming well. So these guys don't get their own little yellow box um, because they were further down on the list of the Leadership Council's proposals. And I'll say, I've probably said this about five times, but all of these proposals were brought forth very thoughtfully and with good reason by our leadership team. There are no proposals that are on this chart anywhere that are dumb or frivolous or not truly important to the district. So if we were to be funded at a much higher level and we were able to have a budget to support all of these, they would most certainly all be in there. Um, so the, you know, it's a difficult task for us to say that you know, 11 is more important than 12 or 3 is more important than 8. These are some of the items that we didn't rank because we felt that they didn't quite make the, uh, the, the yellow box list. Uh, but we also didn't feel that they should just be put in a drawer and forgotten about. We, we really want folks to understand that we're thinking forward, we're looking at places where we have some deficits, and where we'd like to make some changes. And um, in our leadership workshop with the school board, um, we've spoken, I think, pretty clearly about what these, these items are and what they would look like. And uh, we can expect to see them come back around in the future. Yeah, these are really about putting the community on notice, much like we did with Career Pathways. You know, it's coming, it's coming. And you know, the time, I think some would argue, has come for some of these positions um, and these needs but they're definitely things that we want top of mind as we move forward. So last year we really tried to switch the narrative. I heard some people making um, reference to what was cut out of the budget. Um, know that nothing has been cut out of the budget yet, right? Um, we don't have a budget yet, so we can't cut things. Things have been prioritized, um, and there's some things that some, some needs that are met in this budget and some that are unmet. But we really want to be able to give everyone something to vote for in the budget. We realize that we can't do it all, all at once, um, but we want you to trust in us that we're using all of our ex collective expertise and efficacy to prioritize things um, based on what we see as the most emergent needs. And so this table really just highlights what's in the budget. Um, and I would just ask if there's something within the Scarborough Public Schools that you currently experience and you love, that's something to come out and vote for too. Um, and these are also the new investments. So we're responding to the enrollment needs, we're providing essential transportation safety communication, providing equitable funding for consumable instructional supplies, responding to projected um, enrollment needs, we're expanding career expo exploration opportunities, expanding middle school supports for students at risk, we're developing a high school um, STEM teaching position, we're supporting over 500 plus employees with this budget proposal. And I won't rehash the unmet needs because it makes everybody sad, um, but they're here and we're communicating about them because we want you to know that they're going to come back around and we're going to continue advocating for them because we believe that this is what our students deserve. So to keep you engaged, we wanna just close out tonight by reviewing the next steps and making you really aware of the budget process tonight so happy to see so many folks here and um, sharing their comments about what you like and don't like about the budget proposal so far we hope that you do that again on wednesday may or april 10th when we go before the town council for their first reading vote 
There will be a public hearing on May 1st at the town council meeting. Again, another opportunity to come out and talk about what's in this budget that matters to you um, and what's not in the budget that matters to you. We wanna hear all of that on May 1st. We have um, budget outreach meetings that our town council and school board will be doing together and the next slide outlines that for you. And then we have our second reading dates. Um, this is where the town council makes the final um, appropriation for the school department operating budget. And then we have to make adjustments to ensure that our, our budget aligns to whatever that bottom line expectation is. And then get out the vote, come vote, bring your friends, vote early. Um, we wanna have the best biggest voter turnout ever for the FY20 school budget on June 11th. And also for that regional partnership, 83 additional thousand dollars that will come to Scarborough. If we don't vote yes for that, then we have to reduce our budget by that much. So it's a big important time to be involved and be engaged. And then I'll leave you, oh. I forgot to put that other slide in about the budget outreach meeting, but before we post this, I'll stick it in there for you. I have it in my slide, Julia. So oh, then you're going to show it? Okay, perfect. Um, so then any questions that the board might have to clarify um, what Kate and I shared with you tonight, you've also heard from the Leadership Council um, in order to make your, your vote on your first reading. Just questions, Julia, or can we make comments at this we, time? We asked a lot like, of questions yesterday. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'd like to make some comments, but I sure. don't want to, if, that, if now's should, not the right time. I think we should do that after we make a sure. movement. Sure, absolutely. So after a motion, we'll maybe a motion. we can comment. Sure. Yeah. Any clarifying questions to prepare you for your vote? I have one question. Sure. So you said that the tax increase, the percent is based off whatever the value of the town is and then also the school budget, right? Or the town budget? Think of it like this. So this is my visual for it. There's a, a big pie, right? And mm -hmm. part of it's the school and part of it's the town. It's really like two-thirds school, one-third town, right? That's what we're asking for our net ask. So for the schools, it's 5.7% over last year. For the town, I think it's like 2.4% over last year. Then you divide that by the overall valuation of the town to get to that percent, that mill rate. So will the current revaluation be finished by the time they determine that percentage? So the valuation is never done by the time we go to vote. Um, we typically get that number sometime in August, but the town has a, a formula within their um, charter or ordinances that tells them how to calculate that based on a multi-year average. Um, but this year, the council goal is a 3% is, um, a three tax rate or less, not calculating or not considering the revaluation in that, in our projections. So we're not including that in our projections. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Good question, John. I just want to clarify something on slide 36 when you start talking about um, the budget process. You... I think you did this for comparison reasons, but I just want to clarify, you have the um, FY19 final approved budget up at the top, mm -hmm. and then you start talking about what the FY20 level services budget is. Yeah. I just want to clarify that you don't just take that mm. huge number from last year and add on to it. Absolutely not, and I'm okay. just going to pull that slide up um, so folks Sorry, that's, yeah, that's the one. That's the one, Julie. You're on it. No, um, the one that you were on before. <laughs> <laughs> one more. Um, it's 36. And it's got to be 24. It's got to be 24. <clears throat> on mine, it's slide 36. Yeah, it does look Our slide shows a little different. Yeah, I think I, I made some last minute adjustments. <laughs> Surprise. Um, so yeah, this it. is what Hillary's referring to. And so we absolutely do not just say, oh, here's our starting point. Let's talk about what we're going to add to the budget. That's this, like, hundreds of hours, literally, I'm not exaggerating, I'm probably underestimating, goes into this what we call level services. So remember how I said we used to call that status quo, but I think we were selling ourselves short because there's nothing status quo about that. We literally go through line by line and say, okay, principals, okay, directors, last year we approved... X amount. To date, you've spent X amount. How much do you need for next year? Mm -hmm. And they'll tell us what they, they need, and then they justify it, and they defend it, really. And we're like, well, do you really need that? Are you sure? And sometimes 
you know, Kate will say, well, let's round that up, and I'll be like, nope, like, keep it to the dollar. <laughs> if we could put cents in the budget, I probably would. Um, but no we don't. Pennies in no pennies budget. in her budget. Um, so that, that process is, the, takes mo many months, or it takes two months, actually, I should say. Um, feels like many months. We do that really through December and January, before we even look at, um, or really kind of parallel when we're looking. I, I mean, I heard that the past two days. I just wanted to clarify because of the way it, it's. Well, and the, the like reason that the, the FY19 budget is sort of sitting up there in its little, its little special throne is because that's the starting point for us to determine the difference from last year to this year. So the increase from year to year. Right. Um, and so it's not like a starting point in the sense of you know, we take this budget and we add 3% or something like that. It's the starting point in the sense of we need to know where we're coming from and where we're going to to identify the, the, the number of the change. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yep. Great sure. question. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, before we go into new business, I would ask for a motion to extend the time for new business to 10 o'clock. Um, given that I imagine there'll be some conversation regarding our proposed budget. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Begrudgingly. Begrudgingly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 8.0. Sarah, um, will you be making the motions? I will. So uh, in front of you, you guys have a piece of paper that has four uh, individual motions. Um, for the second reading, we'll do those individually. For the first reading, um, we're gonna, I'm going to bundle those together. Um, so I move to uh, um, approval to adopt the Leadership Council's budget proposal as presented, presented for first reading. Total general fund operating budget is proposed at 51,504,241 with offsetting non-tax revenues of 4242000 532 and a tax request to the town of $47,261,709. I'll also move to up for approval to adopt the adult education budget as presented for first re reading. Total education budget is proposed at $202,311 with offsetting non-tax revenues of $104,784 and a tax request to the town of 97527 Move approval to adopt the school nutrition budget as presented for first reading. Total school nutrition budget is proposed at $1,746,555 with offsetting non-tax revenues of $1,556,555 and a tax request to the town of 200000 and finally, I move approval to adopt the capital improvements budget as pre presented for first reading. Capital equipment proposed budget is $777,070. Uh, and capital projects proposed budget is $1,625,000. So moved. Second. Discussion? I think that was the hardest thing I'll ever have to do. Bring <laughs> <laughs> all those numbers. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to approve approve this uh, vote to move this forward um, tonight. Um, but I have a caveat. Um, I really am not okay with unified basketball not being part of its budget. I am, um, I, the people who spoke tonight were so powerful um, in their words, and I agree with them 100%. I, the community member who talked about uh, the 17.5 being um, not necessarily an accurate um, reflection of what it will truly cost it re is resonating with me. I too believe that's true. I talked about this yesterday at uh, our workshop, and I will say it again tonight that even if we don't fund the total cost of it, it absolutely 100% needs to be in this budget. I think we need to be creative. I think we need to, to um, work collaborative, collaboratively with the community to find some other funding sources. 
I reached out to uh, a friend of mine who, I, I mean, I, I was on boosters for years in this community. I reached out a friend of mine um, who is still on boosters to ask that person about whether or not there would be any, any um, interest in uh, our booster community supporting this program. And um, they indicated that they absolutely thought that booster groups could, could really rally around that. So I feel like we need to um, bring the whole community in and figure out how to fund that. I'm not saying that we have to fund it 100%, and that's for the finance committee to, to look at, but I think we definitely need to get it on the books that as a community, through, the, through our school budget, we are supporting that program. So I'm really asking you guys to, to go back and, and look at that. I, I also just want to um, just make a comment that uh, it's really challenging to, to make a school um, budget that's 3%. I think it's unfair that, that the school department is asked to do that. We have so much growth in this town. This budget is really lean. It's addressing our increases in, in enrollment. It's addressing uh, special services that, that we are morally and legally obligated to provide for our students. And yet we have to agree to this arbitrary 3%. I think it really sets us up right out of the gate um, in terms of the community perspective of the budget. So I just really wanted to acknowledge that and um, just, just say, that, say, say to the community tonight that this is a very responsible budget that is really looking to address the needs that we have in this community. And those needs are in part created because of the growth that our town government is supporting. I don't know if I should remove this thing or not. Um, so I just want to take a moment to make a quick statement about this budget um, and the amount of work that's gone into it. I've worked in education for about 15 years now, and in each of those years, I've been involved in some way with the creation of the budget. And I can say from personal experience, most of those efforts did not show the type of line-by-line -line scrutiny and grueling work that was done to create this budget in this town. Um, and, and some of them may have even gotten close to what they were so close to say they didn't do, which is taking that yellow line and saying, well, we can maybe get 3%, let's tack that number on there and see if it flies. Um, so much more than that is done, so much more uh, effort and, and, and in transparency to, to all of that to make sure the community understands that every dollar that's invested is spent with, with the ultimate vision of serving our students in mind. So I wanted to take a moment just to say that and to say that as far as first readings go, um, you know, getting this out there and keeping the conversation moving, knowing that there are some passionate programs, as Amy just spoke about, that we have to revisit and think about. And there's also a demand and a charge from our town council that we should take seriously as well and try and find some kind of middle ground, somewhere where we can land, where we can all be comfortable with it. And that's work that has to continue. It's work that this board as a whole is going to pick up, speaking for myself. I've had other priorities, as many of you know, um, that I've put my focus on, and that's why we have committees, and that's why we split duty. Um, but I want to recognize the members of our finance committee that are sitting here at the table with me because it's a lot of work to get us to this point, and now as a board, um, the work has to continue to get us to second reading and hopefully to voter support in June. Um, but I also will support this because I know the work that's gone into it as first readings go. I've rarely seen work to this level, so thank you. Thank you. We're just going down. Yeah, I, mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> um, I wrote mine, so I apologize. I'm going to read it as written, and I apologize if there are some redundancies. Um, I have some things I would like to say about the budget development process. First, I cannot say enough things in praise of our central office administration and our leadership council, who spend hundreds of hours developing a budget that will serve the ever-changing needs of both our staff and our students. Our entire Scarborough community benefits from their dedication and their commitment to high standards. On a personal note, I would like to thank both Julie and Kate for their patience and generously giving of their time to answer the well over 100 questions that I have asked <laughs> in the last two months. In regards to the process, uh, for anyone who, that may, who may be unaware, it was over a month ago that the BOE Finance Committee met with the Town Council Finance Committee to discuss goals for the overall change in the mill rate. As a group, we did agree that Julie and Tom would work together to deliver a budget that would result in a 3% increase to the mill rate. At that time, we as a Board Finance Committee also communicated that Scarborough Public Schools may require some additional funding 
to account for not only our, increase, our increases in enrollment, but also the increased special services that some of our incoming students will require. Every person elected to the BOE takes an oath that, will put our, that we will put our students first. And for me, honoring that oath means that I have, per, I have a personal responsibility to advocate for funding that ensures that every student in the district has access to a high quality education. That being said, I also feel a personal responsibility mm -hmm. to present a budget to the town council and ultimately to the voters that I feel will be well received. I am a person of my word and I am empathetic to those members of the community who feel that we have failed to hit our budget goal. I would love nothing more than to put our budget battles um, of the past behind us, but doing so will require an open and honest conversation, true compromise, and community engagement. I will end by saying that the budget we are voting on tonight is only the first reading. Now, we have seen that, now that we have seen the impact that such a budget will have on the mill rate, I am confident that the Finance Committee and the Superintendent mutually agree that we have some work to do to present a budget that is respectful to our goal without compromising our high standards. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'll just say, I don't have anything um, eloquently written out <laughs> like April does, but um, I just wanted to echo um, the sentiments that the three people who have spoken have already said, which is that I really appreciate the massive amount of work that's gone into this. Um, and um, a, as many of you may know, yesterday and the day before, um, we as a board had a chance to meet with the Leadership Council and hear the proposals um, from them, which is really powerful for us because they're the ones who are um, the one, they're the ones who are on the ground, they're passionately advocating for something that they are doing every day, and, um, and that really is meaningful to me, and I know that it is to um, the rest of the board also. I do want to say that um, we, we did discuss some of the, the unified basketball came up yesterday and as, as a um, priority that, that many of us would like to see above that red line. Um, and like Amy said, I'm just going to, like Amy said, I feel like if we can, if if funding the seventeen thousand five hundred dollars is not doable for us, I feel I agree strongly with you that we have to fund something because if we don't put money into the budget to show that it is a priority for us, then then I feel disingenuous asking other people um, to contribute to that funding. Um, again, this is a first reading. I also want to point out that. Um, that a 3% mill rate is not um, equal to a 3% increase in the school budget. Um, so I just, I think that's a misconception that a lot of people have that um, just because the school budget portion of the tax ask is higher than 3% doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that our mill rate will be higher than 3%. So I do just, I did just wanna clarify that. Um, but overall, I'll be supporting this as a first reading, um, and and as all of you have said previously, that it's a starting point, and um, there's a lot of things that can be moved around as we continue to work on this. Um, I just want to reiterate again the point you said, thanking everyone, and I said this to you guys yesterday, and everyone who's here um, or who's not here that was there, just thank you so much for the effort that you put into it. Um, I came into this position um, on the board and also as the chair of the finance committee with sort of eyes wide open knowing that this, we've had some division in the town and the budget has always been such a contentious issue um, and wanting to, to change that but also wanting to, to see the process through from start to finish and then afterwards be able to assess all right, where can we, where can we try and make adjustments. Um, and I have some thoughts on that, and I'll reserve those for, for later on in the budget cycle. Um, I did have a long speech written out, but I, I don't know that it's appropriate or necessary right now, um, given that this is just a starting point. Um, but we do have to find a way to get out of the cycle, uh, because there's a lot of injustices in the cycle, and one of them April touched upon. Um, and the fact that it feels like the school is just constantly fighting for, for basic needs. Uh, like Amy said, this is not um, 
a fluffy budget. And I'm not suggesting that we go out there willy-nilly and just ask for everything. Um, but we're really, it, even in the first reading, um, taking away some pretty basic and core fundamental needs that our students are, and our teachers have to ha um, are, are requesting just to provide basic services. Um, and so that's something that, you know, as we continue to go through the budget process, we'll look to figure out a way that we can change. I'm not saying I have the answer or that there is an answer. Um, but as a town, as a community, we have to want to be better and get out of this cycle. Um, and so hopefully uh, in the coming years we can look to do that. But uh, I'll obviously be supporting this <laughs> first reading. So I was hoping you could go to slide six. Um, Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to say just a different way what everybody else has said. I, I um, really have learned so much from all of the people that um, are employed by the town of Scarborough and the schools and, and listening to their expertise and watching the amount of hours that they've put into developing this budget. I mean, just tremendously hard work and creativity and um, really wanting to make the best decisions that they can. Um, I don't think, it, which, it was which, it was the slide of Dylan's um, from Miss Lee's class. Oh, oh the frogs. Yeah, I, I would have said frogs, but I wasn't sure if they were frogs. <laughs> um, so so that, was, that was really beneficial for me. I learned a lot. Um, I was super impressed with, with the hard work and I wanna thank everybody for, for doing that. Um, I want to acknowledge that there's um, a, a large sector, section of our town that struggles to continue to live in, in Scarborough, and that's something that um, I think is obviously really important, and I want to recognize that, and I don't want our conversations to be um, mutually exclusive. I, I think that we we need to realize that um, we're a community, the school's part of the community, and the, um, the people that are struggling to live here are a part of our community, and we need to work together to figure out a solution. Um, I think that growth needs to be, obviously, front and center in our conversations. Um, we've heard about the trouble, really, if you haven't been to any of the long-range um, planning committee talks recently, we've heard about the imminent trouble that Eight Corners is in as a result of the growth and um, that there's absolutely no room right now for, for students next year. But I was really struck when Dylan was presenting that Dylan just happened upon a classroom in, in Blue Point, which is, I think, the, in the best shape of all of our three. <laughs> Uh, space-wise elementary schools and you see the creativity of our teachers at work here when they have make storage space up to the ceiling and this is the the best case scenario of our schools right now and those kids are I mean I can't imagine how claustrophobic that must feel to be in a classroom with storage space to the ceiling and they're just you know little people so it shows the it shows you know, what people are doing and how they continue to do their best and, and also, you know, the, the, the situation where kids are learning. And so I just hope that as we continue the conversation about growth, we keep that in mind about the impact to our schools and, and, and recognize that tension. Thank you. Um, just to close out on the comments, again, thank you for everybody for the amazing amount of work and effort and energy that went into this. Again, that budget book was so easy to understand. Thank you, I really, it means, means a lot to be able to pick this up and know what you mean. Spending the time the last couple of days has been incredible. Um, I can't say thank you enough and you'll see it again in the chair's report. I did some quick math and as folks have mentioned tonight, growth has been a big issue in our town and we're at 9% growth in our K2s. 9%. That is going to carry on. It's going to get bigger each and every year. We can't keep shortchanging. Um, something that hasn't been addressed in here, the recommended maintenance of our buildings. We are funding less than half, half of what we should be funding. We have gotten by 
with a wing and a prayer, and thank goodness for the MacGyver-like techniques that our building crews have. Um, Todd is a genius with what he has done. Thank you for that. But we have been really lucky. We have dodged a lot of expenses, and that bill's coming due really quick. Um, and as everyone else has said, Unified Basketball, I really do think that as a community, I hope we can rally around this. Um, I've also reached out to two of the booster groups and asked, what can you do to get support for this? Let's make it happen. It's, it is so important to not only our students, but our community. And it's an easy win for us. We, we have to make it happen. So, yeah, getting all choked up. Um, with that, move to approve for the first reading of the budget as presented. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for your support and all of your kind words about the work that this team has done. I would say to the leadership council, if you would like to go home, um, <laughs> you are certainly welcome to do that. And it really means a lot to Kate and I to, for you to stay tonight during our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4. I'm going to bundle all of these together. Uh, motion to approve the meeting minutes for the workshop of March 7th, 2019. The meeting, mis meeting minutes of the business portion of the March 7th meeting. And the meeting minutes of a special meeting on March 13th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, 8.6 appointments. 8.6.1 high school strength coaches. Uh, the recommendation would be to approve the two high school strength and conditioning coaches as printed and funded through the general fund. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. 8.6.2, high school spring coaches. The recommendation would be to approve the high school spring coaches as printed, noticing that several are booster funded and some are funded out of the general fund as well. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. And 8.6.3, middle school spring coaches. The recommendation would be to approve the middle school spring coaches as printed to be funded through the general fund. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Excellent. 9.0, chair's report. Do you have the, oh, I didn't have that on here. Um, there was a, another, Agenda we item? Time. Well, we can pop that in. Okay. 8.7, the Pleasant Hill School donation. Um, the recommendation would be to approve the $582 donation from Hannaford Helps. I believe this is the third time the Scarborough School Board has seen a donation from Hannaford Helps. Um, I think the high school received it once this year, the middle school received it once this year, um, and they, they really turn these monies over to us with full confidence that we will use it in the, the best interest of our students. Um, and we're very grateful for this, for this donation. Kate, do you know, is it specifically to our food service program? Uh, for Hanford Helps, no. It's just general, right? General donations. So it's $582 to Pleasant Hill, which I know they will put to great use. Motion to accept the donation? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thank you. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. All those in favor? No, Sarah had a discussion. Oh, no, I didn't. No, no, I just was voting. <laughs> <laughs> let's go, let's go. <laughs> you nailed it. Rapid fire voting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have that? A chance? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. We will I move quick to the chair's report. Um, I decided on this one to make it just a little bit different as it's coming up, um, and it's a timeline because I've done a lot of words about the superintendent search and figured we should really give just where we are with things um, just from a timeline perspective, where we started, where we are, and where things are going. Thank you. All right. So in January, we had the selection of the search firm. February, public forum, a staff forum, and then the selection of the interview committee. 
Um, big thank yous to that committee who got together and spent a lot of hours um, understanding the process as well as a lot of hours meeting with the candidates. Um, March saw workshops being held, again, with those committee members, um, the board review of the initial applications and that first round being completed, which brings us to April. Second round interviews will be conducted. We will have district visits where the candidates, um, where we will go to meet the candidates in their home turf, and then on-site visits where they will be invited to Scarborough. They'll get to meet with people, um, tour our facilities, public will have a chance to meet with them as well, and then the final selection of the candidate will occur in April. And then those on-site visits, market calendars, they are tentatively scheduled for the 25th, 26th, and 29th of April. Um, candidates will be meeting with leadership council, town officials and staff, central office, students, our school staff, and our community. And as those dates get closer, a full agenda will be put out uh, with times, places, and activities. And our intention is to announce the candidate by the first week of May. Built in a little bit of buffer time in there um, if we do go all the way through to the 29th. And knowing that tonight was going to be a late night, um, I'm ending it with thank yous. This is long overdue um, to the entire board. Thank you for the countless hours, the effort, the energy, um, the support that people are showing to one another through all of this. To our administration, holy cow, thank you. Um, whether it's a late night text message of how do I get through this one, to Kate and the work that you do, always answering questions, thank you. Um, the teachers, our staff, everybody, thank you. Um, there's just so many ways to say it. And with that, committee reports. Good Lord. Good Lord. I wanted to keep it to one slide, okay? <laughs> and I did. I'm going to bust through this because um, if anyone has any questions, come, come to one of the communications members. But uh, just really quickly, I, I put a link on here, but we don't need to do it. The district newsletter came out um, yesterday, yesterday, maybe. Um, there's paper copies downstairs, upstairs, at the library. Hopefully, Dylan, did you bring them to the library? Yes. Um, Thank you, Dylan. It's, it talks a little bit about the superintendent search, a little bit about the Eight Corners um, project. A little bit uh, about a reminder about kindergarten registration and um, some of the grants and donations that we've been lucky enough to receive. Um, we're going to start work on our next newsletter, which is going to be a special budget edition. Um, and uh, we're also going to start trying to think of a process by which other committees can come to communications to get information out. Um, without relying on that kind of like word of mouth and like, oh, this person's on this committee and oops, I forgot to, whatever. Um, also, I wanted to quickly say that we did have our first roundtable discussion um, that we did in conjunction with the town council. Um, um, I was there, Nick was there, and April was there. And mostly we talked about the Eight Corners project. Yep. Um, I would say that took up the lion's share of um, of the night. Uh, we talked a little bit about budget, but obviously we didn't have very much detail to go on yet. Um, and then we also touched on recycling. Um, shockingly, there's a lot of things that are not recyclable that, that you might want to check <laughs> out. Very informative. It was very informative. It was very informative. Um, the next round table is June 25th. We're doing these quarterly. Um, it's, it seems like uh, far away, but um, it'll be here before you know it. It's going to be at Blue Point School. We're going to try and move the locations of those. Um, the Spotlight Award winner announcement will be coming out soon and will be um, um, delivered at the next meeting. I put our social media stuff on there and I have a really cute video that I wanted to show but now I don't know if it's too late. Yeah, show it. Okay, it's the, it's the link on the return on investments. Um, and I just stuck it under our, um, our social media because we're going to put, we're going to um, post that on our social media. It's short, but it's adorable. Do you want to give some context? Oh, um, sure. So, wait. 
so we had thought a little bit about doing some posts on social media to talk about um, return on invest on our investments that we've made in the past. Um, and so this was this is our first attempt. Um, I would just add that last year we were able to expand world language without um, asking for a new investment through uh, attrition and our middle school enrollment's a little bit lower. Um, so we were able to share a, an existing teacher with Wentworth and we also doubled the amount of world language that sixth graders are receiving all for no new money next, last year. There was only one video embedded. Well, there was the district newsletter embedded, but I think I, I skipped to, over that one. Oh. I need to learn this embedding thing. Right. My slide is seeing boring okay. now. Well, you got nothing on. That. Um, so, so for uh, for everyone that's uh, been watching uh, our happenings so the last week or so, I'll just kind of touch on this again. The Long Range Facilities Planning Committee has been talking much more about the short term than the long term in recent um, uh, weeks. Um, and really, it comes down to some much needed, uh, need, uh, much needed space at eight corners in the form of temporary classrooms, also known as modulars. Um, there have been four public presentations. Um, the first one was on the 21st, and that was our last board meeting. Then, as Hillary mentioned, there was a roundtable on the 26th, and this came up as a very dominant topic, and so we spent a lot of time speaking with the public about it. On the 27th, we met with the Finance Committee of the Town Council, uh, and then they actually moved and asked us to come back and speak uh, last night at their finance committee, uh, no, I'm sorry, not their finance committee, their workshop, uh, it was nice to, uh, very nice of them to make space for us um, because they moved some things out of the way because they knew how important this need was, so we're very grateful for that. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, I, I'm, I'm spoken about this at great length, and I know people are tired, but I would just want to go through and say that um, we had a, some real positive responses and a positive reception from our town council, some wonderful questions about this. Uh, we were able to flesh out specifically the differences between a short-term approach that these portable classrooms will allow us to mitigate for growth at eight corners and how that connects with our long-term issue of growing um, enrollments that's been talked about several times tonight. Uh, the Long Range Planning Committee is going to be actually re-engaging, in fact we're going to be engaging before now, in talking with our building committee at Wentworth and revisiting that process. Um, that was pushed off to deal with the immediate need, but now we're back to, on the 10th of April, talking with the uh, people that are involved in the Wentworth building process and um, some of the lessons learned from that process, exactly how it went. Uh, we want to review our 2017 facilities master plan, look at some of the evidence that was presented there. And perhaps, you know, the, the other thing is, even though the study is less than two years old, it's important to realize that there may be some changes and things that have to be freshened up. In particular, one of the things that's arisen is taking a look at our site options again. Uh, we have some space that is allocated in the new Downs development um, that we can think about, but also here in our central campus with the development that's happened around us, namely on Sawyer Road, some of the wetlands and some of our uh, you know, more sensitive areas may have shifted because water has to find a place to go and Scarborough is a low town. And we know from working with Larissa, the assistant town manager, that we've used up our credits and our ability to be able to offset wetlands uh, on central campus. So that might limit our ability in places that we could potentially put a new school 
here on our uh, central campus. And so our next steps really are talking about establishing a building committee, what that looks like. Uh, is that a transition from a long-range uh, uh, facilities planning group? Uh, speaking for myself, I know I only have so many hours in the day. Um, so I, we want to think about making sure that we're using our board resources responsibly and also our, our, our community resources. Um, in June, I've been approached by our liaison to the town council to think about putting together a booth um, at the polls to actually gather community input on tablets. So there'll be some questions that we'll be putting together as a committee and hopefully having a presence. Uh, let me say this, definitely having a presence of some kind um, at the elections. And then finally, we set the goal of the workshop with town council, um, and it happened organically, and so I'm going to stick with it, of having something on the ballot for June 2020 about an action we will take for a brick and mortar solution to the growing enrollment we have in our youngest students. Could I just add one thing? Please do. Um, I think that that's a brilliant idea to have a booth at the polls and gather input from the community. Another mm -hmm. opportunity you might want to take advantage of would be Summerfest yeah, in August. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. too. Very good. Oh, and the image up there is, is the, um, an aerial of eight corners, and the light blue <laughs> is the, um, the, the temporary classrooms we talked about with our town council, namely funded through the impact fees. It feels like we have some good support. We'll know more on the 10th when they vote on this issue. And then the yellow block would be some conditional classrooms, two additional classrooms we would add if enrollment plays out and we find out that in the time it takes for us to have the conversations and come up with our brick and mortar solution and have it hopefully actualized, if we need additional space, that is planned in there as a conditional expansion. Okay, this is my slide. I used all my energy on the communication slide. <laughs> so, um, this is what, what was left. I'm sorry, I'm wondering. Curriculum's very important to, <laughs> to us. Um, so, um, just uh, at the top, I have our next meeting is April 9th at 4 p.m. And I, I also forgot to mention that it, it was on the slide, but I forgot to mention that our next um, uh, communications meeting is also on April 9th. Um, anyway, at the last meeting, we have been talking about um, what is curriculum, and um, uh, we really feel the need to um, quickly define what that is or, or try and get the word out what that is to not only to the rest of the board but to the community um, in, in general because um, the, the feeling is that um, it's a, it, a lot of people have held on to the old-fashioned idea that curriculum is um, the book that we use to teach math or the book that we use for the, you know, on how to teach English. Um, and, and the reality is that that's not the case anymore. There's just, um, it's so much more um, customized. Yeah, customized. And there's so much more out there besides that book um, that we have been talking a lot about how to get the word out, like curriculum. And, and not, to be honest, curriculum doesn't even mean the same thing to two people in the same room. So, um, <laughs> and and so that and that just goes along with how we view their curriculum too, and that it's not just a set of books anymore. So um, we're talking about that. We're also um, uh, Monique and Julie have arranged for the um, curriculum committee to go on some curriculum tours at the um, individual buildings. It's going to be over two days. Um, one day in April and one day in May, um, the principals have um, very generously uh, scheduled time for us to come in um, and talk to teachers, see classrooms, um, and just kind of get a uh, good idea of what our curriculum looks like on the ground um, in use every day. Um, some of our goals for that tour is to figure out how the board can help with any curriculum needs in the future. Um, and to gain a little bit more insight into any budgetary needs that curriculum has. Um, and then the last thing that we have talked about, um, um, Monique has um, talked about the fact that we're going to be moving away from the STAR assessment that we currently use, um, and we are going to be forming a committee to um, figure out what is going to replace that as our universal assessment tool. Did I do good, Monique? <laughs> Okay, policy, and I obviously need to up my game on the slide. Um, so we have with legal review, allergies and sensitivities, the agenda planning and format. Um, those should be back to be reviewed hopefully next week. Um, in flight, we did meet with the high school teachers and the instructional leadership team to review the graduation policy. We'll be continuing that work on Monday. 
um, hoping to finalize that graduation policy so we can send that for legal review with a goal of a first reading at our next board meeting. Um, upcoming or what is necessary to start looking at, the wellness policy, student fees, so that's adopted for the September start. Um, the school resource officer MOU and the SEF MOU are both on the docket that need to be reviewed soon. Our next meeting is in Chambers B, Monday the 8th at 4.30. It will include leadership, um, the ILT from the high school, and we're also opening it up to the public. If you want to hear what's going on with the graduation policy, you are more than welcome. Um, so again, Chambers B, um, Monday at 4.30. I think we've talked ad nauseum about um, <laughs> the budget, so I'm just gonna leave you with the budget outreach sessions, there's five. The first one is Monday, um, and then the rest of them are happening over the course of April and May. We would encourage anyone from the town, if you have questions um, or things that you want to advocate for, that's a perfect opportunity to do it. And the budget's available on the portal, which can be accessed by the town and the school site. I think I have some, like, meme in there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say. <laughs> 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 on positions. We'll go with your songs. District communication. Uh, so that um, that team has met, actually just met uh, like a couple days ago, Tuesday. Um, there are, <laughs> so um, as you know, that our presence on Twitter and Facebook and um, Instagram have been uh, has steadily increased um, as we try to get just the everyday work of our schools out into um, into the community. Um, it's not very natural to, to use all three of those platforms together without um, individually posting to each one. Um, so the way we have it set now is like a free program that kind of like basically takes what you put on Instagram, which then talks to Facebook because they're related, and then pushes it out to Twitter. Instagram, Twitter, Twitter Facebook. Facebook. Okay. Um, anyway, there are some concerns that like um, Facebook people don't understand what Twitter people are talking about because <laughs> Twitter people have like their own special words and hashtags and terminology. Language um, economics. There's like a, yeah, there's a language barrier there. <laughs> um, but uh, we're doing the best we can to try and, uh, you know, what we've come to realize is that different groups of people use different, you know, um, different ones platforms. of these platforms. And we don't want to exclude a certain group. Um, so we're doing the best we can to use all three um, and, and also keep the um, ask of all these instructional coaches and people who are posting reasonable. Um, also, it, it's probably going to come up in policy pretty soon that um, we are going to, we need to, we don't have, actually, Julie, you might be able to speak to this better than I can, but sure. we don't currently have a policy uh, around a social, social media, media for teacher use or student use, um, and that does put us at some um, liability. So, um, yeah. Comprehensive needs assessment? Uh, so the people who have committed to being on the comprehensive needs assessment committee have committed to three dates, um, and that was part of the prerequisite for being on the committee. Um, we've had the first of we've had the first two of the three meetings. Um, those are facilitated by Kathy Terrell and Monique Culberson, um, who do a, a fantastic job wrangling a very big room, big group of people. Um, the format of the meetings has been to um, take a portion of the CNA and at each phase level there's a table and so you stick with your phase level for all three meetings and you analyze your portion of the CNA. Um, and so we will continue to work through the data um, and you can expect a more comprehensive presentation which will highlight how the comprehensive, comprehensive needs assessment plan fits in with the budget. Um, and so the next meeting is Tuesday, May 28th um, in, in Wentworth. Great. I think the, the only thing I would add to what April's um, comments are stating is that the CNA, the district goals that we talked about earlier, that fourth leg of the table, um, 
actually are a part of the CNA plan. And so those things really come together. So if you're wondering about um, different initiatives, like say the start time change, um, talking about that within the context of assessing our progress towards our goal is the most natural way for that conversation to happen. And we plan to bring that to you as sort of our end of year progress report in June after the third CNA meeting. The Health Student Safety and Advisory Team. Sorry, I forgot the other S in there. Thank you. Uh, so we've met twice since I've joined the group. Uh, the next meeting will be May 23rd at 8.30 in um, Council Chambers at Town Hall. Uh, both meetings we discussed the District Emergency Management Team and the hard work that they've been doing. That group um, includes some of our colleagues from the Town of Scarborough and the Public Safety uh, department and um, administrators from the school as well as staff and what they have been doing is just planning for any potential emergency that could occur in our schools and how they're going to respond they have every situation um, whether it's a, a man-made um, uh, emergency or a natural disaster they're prepared for it they're going through um, uh, simulations they've had tabletop exercises so it was really um, encouraging to hear all of the work that th they've been doing and how well prepared and organized they are the wellness uh, team has been reviewing the wellness policy and um, they've developed a wellness program for employees and um, we also discussed the nurses and and some of the things that they've done uh, one of the things that was really incredible is they've um, got a suicide uh, awareness program that they have. They've gone out and made outreach to all of the staff members in the schools so that they know what to look for, red flags for somebody that might be at risk, and that runs from uh, teachers to custodians and bus drivers and nutritional staff, and apparently it's working because there has been outreach and, and um, you know, the thing about prevention is you'll never know w what what that means in terms of actually, you know, making a difference, but it's a, a point of contact for somebody in need. So that's really a great program and was really great to hear. Thank you. Town Council. So it's been a busy few weeks. Um, lots of collaboration happening. The Joint Communications Committee hosted our first roundtable. Um, Long Range Planning Committee met with the Finance Committee, and then uh, the full board attended a um, town council workshop last night to discuss the Eight Corners um, trailer proposal. Uh, I personally feel like we're really finding our stride as a group, um, and I'm really encouraged by um, all the great work that you know we are. We're finding a lot of common ground, and it's really encouraging to see um, how much we can do together. Um, in other town council school board related news, um, last night the town council voted unanimously to approve the wording for the Greater Sebago Alliance referendum question. Um, and I had Tody send me the wording, and I'm, I'm going to read it for you guys. Um, so this is what's going to be printed on the ballot. It says, do you favor a plan for Scarborough School Department to join the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center? through an interlocal agreement that will allow the school department to receive additional revenue through state funding formula and to more effectively, efficiently procure goods and services. And so I know there's been a lot of um, communication around this, but we're going to just keep beating that drum that this is essential um, that question people pass one. question one to vote yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, additionally, the town council also voted unanimously to approve the wording for the school budget validation referendum, which is just putting the school budget on the ballot. Um, and that election will be held on Tuesday, June 11th at Scarborough High School from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, there is also um, a discussion and approval of the wording of referendum question regarding the voters' desire to continue to vote on the school budget. Um, and every three years, the town of Scarborough votes to decide whether or not they want to continue to vote on the school budget. Um, and so that was also approved for the ballot. Last, um, and certainly not least, there is a vacancy being created by the resignation of Councillor Babine. Uh, nomination papers were made available today and um, will be available until April 30th for interested persons. Thank you. 
I'm it's, also a vocational. I was going to say, I'm just posting <laughs> right when you <laughs> So the vocational um, committees met on March 14th. Um, the PATHS and WRBC General Advisories Committees um, meet. It was, it was very interesting. It was my first time going. Um, and so um, the, they meet in two separate groups. Um, and so because there are different schools that are members of each one of um, the different service centers. And so um, right now, currently, PATHS is focusing on their attendance. Um, they are also focusing on recruiting as well as um, hosting their annual, their annual career fair. Um, and the Westbrook um, Regional Vocational Center is focused on um, completing their visitations. So they, uh, they host open houses and they encourage um, interested students to come. And those wrapped up on 326, um, after which they will begin to set their course offerings for next year. Um, both programs expressed concern around keeping courses relevant while managing um, funding and space limitations. And then um, our next meeting is um, May 9th. Thank you. All right, we made it. Um, 11.0, motion to adjourn. So Second. moved. <laughs> Second. Okay. I will assume there's no discussion. No. All those in favor. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You're glad you came to this one.